Hey guys, today I'll show you a fantasy thriller TV series named Lucifer, season two. Spoilers ahead, watch out and take care. The drama begins in a bank where bank robbers make their move for some easy money, but unfortunately, Lucifer and Amina Diel step in to halt their spree. It's not about justice, though. They're searching for their mother, a celestial being without a physical form, who can only inhabit the recently deceased. The two brothers have exhaustively searched throughout the city, but their mother is nowhere to be found without traces of her hormone smell. Lucifer starts to feel the pressure. Lucifer's parents are none other than God the Father and the Holy Mother, creators of all things, including Lucifer and Amenadiel themselves. As time went on, God became engrossed with humanity, causing the Holy Mother to grow distant and cold. This left Lucifer unhappy, leading to his failed rebellion and subsequent banishment to hell. Notably, his mother didn't utter a word in his defense. She watched indifferently as Lucifer was expelled from heaven, but she later found herself imprisoned in hell by God. It wasn't until Lucifer took a vacation to Los Angeles that she found a chance to escape to Earth, having to possess a human. Lucifer, in response, did nothing. He watched dispassionately, even sending his protector, Maze, to torment her when in hell. Should she find her way to Earth, it's certain that settling scores with Lucifer would be at the top of her list. FBI agent Chloe catches a case involving the murder of a stand-in actress, her face etched with displeasure. It hasn't been long since she saw Lucifer shot, bleeding out, only for him to be up and bouncing around moments later. She's obtained a sample of Lucifer's blood and is set to run some tests to uncover his true nature. Lucifer was still in the mood for jokes until he saw the stand-in actress's corpse, a steel rod protruding from her forehead like a devil's horn. Lucifer suspects his mother's handiwork. However, the new coroner, Ella, quickly determines that the stand-in actress was strangled and the horn was added post-mortem. Just then, Chloe's ex-husband, Dan, reappears. To cover up a scandal within the police department, Dan's misconduct was quietly dealt with. Now demoted to a beat cop, he's just another pawn under Chloe's command. While Chloe is preoccupied, Lucifer takes the opportunity to strike up a conversation with Ella. Ella is an enthusiastic young woman, a devout believer who wears a cross around her neck yet embraces tolerance for all things. Her view of Satan, that he's been unfairly made the scapegoat for human sins, resonates well with Lucifer, much to his delight. According to the investigation, the stand-in actress lived in a villa, rented from an old lady who worked as a nurse on set, and was the one who recommended the stand-in actress to be the superstar's stand-in actress. The landlady complains about the superstar's illegal substance use, and is convinced that her bad influence led to the stand-in actress's untimely demise. Chloe discovers a stack of money tucked away in the sofa of the stand-in actress's villa, a place adorned with vibrant flowers and flamboyant flamingo ornaments. Lucifer is convinced that the attractive superstar has been possessed by Lucifer's mother, who in a frenzied state, murdered the stand-in actress. He can't wait to share this theory with Amina Diel. Amina Diel, still entangled in his thoughts about Maze's recent disappearance, becomes focused when he hears that Chloe has collected Lucifer's blood for testing. He urged Lucifer to handle his mother's mess and proposed to go retrieve the blood sample himself, saying that it's not good for a human to hold something so sacred. Meanwhile, Officer Dan finds out that the relationship between the superstar and the stand-in actress was turbulent, with a recent argument on record. Chloe suspects that the stand-in actress knew about the superstar's drug habit and tried to blackmail her, which may have led to her murder. Lucifer finds the superstar first, mistaking her for his mother and nearly ends up in an unintended and incestuous encounter, an idea so repulsive that even Lucifer can't stomach it. When Chloe arrives, she finds them disheveled. After questioning, the superstar admits that the stand-in actress was her sobriety companion, and they argued because she had just received a new batch of pills that the stand-in actress tried to prevent her from using. The superstar hands over the illegal substance and the dealer's contact information. She's under strict supervision not to use the substance, which means the drug dealer won't be pleased, perhaps enough to kill the stand-in actress. Now, Lucifer suspects the drug dealer is his mother. The psychologist Dr. Linda's role seems to be to enlighten the audience with all the details that are often left out, as Lucifer confides in her. He blames Maze for resenting him and releasing his mother, blames Aminadil for not securing hell, blames his father God, and even blames Dr. Linda for her lackluster therapy skills. Dr. Linda reminds him that with all his complaints, he's forgetting that someone else should be held accountable. Lucifer, of course, is reluctant to admit any fault of his own. 
Dr. Linda is starting to feel hopeless about her therapy. If Lucifer is unwilling to change, she believes she can't help him. She suggests he needs to seek someone more skilled for counseling. Amenadiel arrives at the police station, intending to use his power to slow down time to a standstill. But as he approaches Chloe's desk, trying to take Lucifer's blood sample back, but his skill suddenly fails him, leaving his move exposed and him completely bewildered. Just then, Chloe receives the whereabouts of the drug dealer. She and Lucifer make a beeline for the location. The drug dealer is hidden within a charity event, and Lucifer, trying to draw him out, goes on stage and pretends he needs some drugs. But he also reveals that he was abandoned by his mother in his downtime without justification, and that's why he also abandoned his mother. Chloe is moved by his revelation, but before she can make any comments, the drug dealer turns up at the door. After an interrogation, they determine the dealer isn't the murderer of the stand-in actress. They also found that the superstar had another supplier, and it's that bigger fish who is likely the culprit. On the other side, the superstar's boyfriend seeks out Lucifer for a showdown, but is intercepted by Maze. Lucifer suspects Maze of releasing his trapped mother from hell, so he challenges her. But Maze reveals that during the period when she was missing, she had been learning how to fit into the human world with her friends, and she offers no further explanation. The superstar's boyfriend discloses that the star used to buy substances from the drug lord, and that the stand-in actress had helped the superstar kick the habit, angering the drug lord. Chloe is still investigating who this drug lord is, knowing only that he deals in prescription substances and is likely someone with a professional medical background. Lucifer discovers from the evidence photos that the landlady's name can be rearranged to spell like the nickname of the drug lord. Recalling that she once said she saw the stand-in actress as her daughter, Lucifer is enraged and sets out to confront the landlady first. Lucifer storms into the landlady's presence, furious and confrontational. He's questioning the landlady how she could even harm her daughter, but he's also venting his frustrations about his own mother. Yet in less than two seconds, the landlady beats him down like a dog, showing that he loses his immortality and powers. It turns out it's because Chloe is right outside the door, neutralizing his power. Chloe meant to ask the coroner Ella about her view on angels, as she harbored doubts about Lucifer's true identity. By chance, Ella reveals that the substance found on the fake horns on the stand-in actress's head is unique to garden decorations. Chloe immediately connects this to the flamingo decorations in front of the landlady's house. Poor Lucifer, who had intended to show off his magic, stands powerless at the door. Chloe hears strange noises inside, bursting in and saving Lucifer with a taser. Lucifer pretends as if nothing happened, and just like that, the case is resolved. The landlady is revealed as the drug lord, having killed the stand-in actress who was blocking her financial path. Chloe really wanted to test Lucifer's blood, but between Amanadiel's advice, Ella's tolerance of faith, and the fact that Lucifer truly had made her a better detective, she decides not to pursue Lucifer's identity any further. Chloe's compromise enlightens Lucifer, prompting an apology to Dr. Linda for him evading her questions. He now acknowledges his own role in his family's tragedy, never questioning the reasons behind his mother's coldness, nor listening to her explanations afterward. Now, Lucifer is preoccupied with another concern. After so much time, his mother should be seeking revenge, but all signs indicate she's not there to kill him, which scares him even more. Chloe discards Lucifer's blood sample. Just when Lucifer thinks he should stop worrying about his mother, she appears before him, bloodied and disheveled, seeking his help. This isn't the first body she's inhabited. She can only possess the recently deceased, but her luck has been bad while searching for some body that could be possessed. After several attempts, she barely awakens before dying again until she finds the body of a blonde beauty whose name is Charlotte. Not understanding modern technology, she first stuffs a thought-to-be phone into a glass of ice. The body is great, aside from the screwdriver sticking out of her back and the blood everywhere. After three days, she stumbles upon Lucifer, rambling about her experiences. Lucifer doesn't buy her story and calls Amina Deal to arrest her. Mother was excited to see her other son, but at the mention of being captured, she interrupts. She insists she doesn't hate Lucifer, just God, and wants to spend more time with her sons. She comes across as a responsible and honest mother, promising not to do any harm on Earth. Lucifer hesitates but grants her a probation period. First of all, he has to check whether his mother went on a killing spree after possessing a body. Since Lucifer has no other women around, he can only let his mother wear Maze's ugly clothes. The two return to the hotel where the body was found, and his mother shows her son all the details. But there's another corpse in the same room, which belongs to a gangster. 
Lucifer decides to investigate the truth behind this case to see if his mother is the culprit. But for now, they need to escape the scene to avoid being suspected. On the way, someone mistakes his mother for a prostitute. Lucifer jokingly says the person can be killed without consequences, and his mother actually takes it seriously and is ready to act. But Lucifer stops her. The clothes are just too much trouble. He decides to send his mother home first and then go to find his colleagues. His mother simply strips off her clothes, and Lucifer wishes he could blind his peeping eyes then and there. Lucifer can't focus on the investigation while watching over his mother, so he has to ask Maze for help. Maze was planning to leave Lucifer, but the moment she sees this tough case, she decides to stay. At the police station, Chloe and Dan are questioning their daughter, Trixie, and find out that she damaged her own doll, hoping to get a better one as a replacement. She's using this method to try to manipulate her parents. Chloe obviously won't indulge Trixie, but Lucifer takes Trixie's side, saying that if you don't give in, you're a bad mother. Mothers should always indulge their children. Lucifer comes to the station to look into Charlotte's case. Chloe soon receives a report from the hotel, which is exactly what he wanted. The deceased gangster has been dead for several days with a wound on his neck, most likely caused by a screwdriver. Lucifer keeps guiding the police to find evidence, suggesting that the woman who fled is the murderer. Besides the deceased gangster, Dan also finds another body, a hotel maid who was strangled to death. Everyone suspects the murderer is male. Only Lucifer insists it's a female, trying to pin the crime on his mother. Ella traces the cell phone's serial number and finds it belongs to a law firm in Beverly Hills. To find the owner of the phone, Lucifer brazenly enters the firm, shouting whose phone that is. It turns out that phone model is a company perk. Everyone has one. Then Lucifer pulls out a pair of shoes from the crime scene, and soon someone recognizes them as belonging to the law firm's senior partner, the same Charlotte whose body is now possessed by Lucifer's mom. When the lawyer hears Charlotte might be in danger, he breaks down in tears. Lucifer uses his power, coaxing him to reveal if he wishes Charlotte dead, but the lawyer denies, saying Charlotte is his lover. Chloe and Lucifer then speculate that the gangster might be Charlotte's kept man, but the lawyer lover is certain that's impossible, saying they are each other's only ones. He even reveals that Charlotte wouldn't even sleep with her husband because she hates that man. That's when the suspect emerges, Charlotte's husband. Charlotte's husband is a stay-at-home dad. Aware of his wife's infidelity, he chose to swallow his pride and stay devoted to raising their children at home. Chloe goes to verify the evidence. During the process, Lucifer unexpectedly discovers a stash of drugs hidden in the husband's home. The drug packages have a fingerprint on them, and the police are currently running a match in their database. Meanwhile, Chloe receives a package containing the new doll Trixie wanted. It turns out Lucifer bought it for her. The fingerprint results come back and are linked to a hitman of a major drug lord. Dan continues to dig for information. Chloe takes in the doll delivery, but Lucifer can't resist and sneakily hides a bag of drugs, thinking to himself that this is the stuff people rely on for a high. Dan discovers that both Charlotte and the gangster were FBI informants attempting to bring down the drug lord's gang. The hotel was their meeting point. The drug lord's hitman, known for his expertise with a screwdriver as a weapon, is now the prime suspect. Charlotte's whereabouts are unknown. She's either captured by the drug lord or on the run from his hitman. Lucifer, worried about his mother's safety, rushes back to the Lux bar to check for any updates, but only learns that she has fled. Maze has been trying to torment Lucifer's mother without success. Now she's found the woman's weakness, trapped in a fragile human body and caring about her son Lucifer. Maze taunts her for her delusional hopes, telling her Lucifer is on God's side and ready to use her as a bargaining chip. Taking advantage of the situation, Mother knocks Maze out, steals Charlotte's credit cards, and runs off. Lucifer fears his mother might be killed by the drug lord's men en route, which would allow her to switch bodies and become untraceable. Lucifer has no choice but to deal with the drug lord directly, warning him to stop pursuing Charlotte. Coincidentally, he finds the drug lord's hidden stash of drugs. The drug lord denies any involvement in the murders. It turns out he's been aware of the gangster's double dealing and even planned to feed false information to the police through him. So he claimed that there's no reason for him to kill the gangster. Moreover, the screwdriver hitman is already dead and couldn't be the killer. Clearly, someone is trying to frame someone else for the crime. Since everyone in the drug trade knows about the death of the screwdriver hitman, framing him would be pointless, eliminating their suspicion. Therefore, the only people who would have a motive and not know about the hitman's death must be from the law firm. Suspicion falls on Charlotte's assistant, who has handled all her cases and knows all about the grudge between Charlotte and the drug lord. 
Despite graduating from a prestigious school, he's still stuck at the bottom of the law firm, harboring enough resentment to commit dire acts. Lucifer intentionally leaks that Charlotte is missing, but not dead, and the assistant panics. Afterward, when Charlotte's credit card transactions surface, the assistant locates Lucifer's mom in Charlotte's body and decides to kill her to eliminate any loose ends. But Lucifer catches the assistant in the act, and Chloe arrests him. Lucifer then instructs his mother to impersonate Charlotte without giving herself away and even stabs her with a screwdriver to mimic the previous injury. It's then that Mother notices how much Lucifer cares for Chloe. The case has been closed, and Chloe reprimands Lucifer for acting on his own without following police regulations. After discussing work, she switches to personal matters, warning Lucifer not to buy toys for her daughter. Lucifer doesn't agree, believing that not fulfilling Trixie's requests is the same as abandoning her. Chloe is sympathetic towards Lucifer's complicated feelings about his mother, but she insists that this is separate from how she wants to raise her own daughter. She can't indulge every one of Trixie's wishes if she wants her to grow up healthy. Lucifer seems contemplative after hearing Chloe's words, possibly realizing that his mother's neglect when he was banished might have been due to hidden difficulties. When he returns home, he is willing to hear his mother out. She confesses that she begged God to banish Lucifer to hell instead of killing him when he rebelled, thus saving his life. She proclaims her eternal love for him, and although Lucifer is skeptical, he seems to accept her words. After he leaves, his mother smirks triumphantly at the sky, her smile hinting at malice. Meanwhile, Amenadiel's powers are fading, and he's cooped up in the office looking for a solution. Dr. Linda comes by from next door. She used to consider Amenadiel a friend, but now she's angry to discover he was just using her to get to Lucifer. She gives him a piece of her mind, and afterward, Amenadiel sincerely apologizes. Linda, seeing his rare humility, forgives him. Back in his office, Amenadiel remains unhappy as his chicken wings are shedding severely as if cursed, and he can't figure out why. The scene shifts to a dramatic scene where a victim with glasses is tied to a pipe, repeatedly offering apologies. However, the killer is unmoved and silently lights a lighter. At the same time, Lucifer is at home playing a candle wax dripping game with a beautiful woman, but his fun is spoiled by his mom's interruption. She wants to see her eldest son, Amenadiel, but Lucifer flatly refuses, saying Amenadiel hasn't shown up on his own, so she'd better get used to life on Earth. At the police station, everyone is busy with their duties. Officer Dan is out on a case and can't pick up his daughter on time. Trixie waits at her mother's desk until her father arrives with candy to make amends, which lifts her spirits. Chloe is still upset with Dan over the previous incidents involving Officer Malcolm and the Palm Street case, to the point that their planned family camping trip might be postponed. Dan tries to explain, but Chloe gets called away for a new case. The victim with glasses, as shown earlier, is the manager of an internet company that specializes in social networking. Now, he has been turned into a charred corpse. A video of him expressing remorse was posted on social media six hours before his death. The materials used to burn him were quite ordinary, offering no leads. However, the highest concentration of the accelerant was found in the victim's smelly parts. Lucifer exclaims in awe that it's truly burning balls. Chloe reminds them to be professional and respectful at the crime scene. The manner of this murder clearly has a punitive element, which piques Lucifer's interest. The victim manager had received several threatening emails in his inbox, clearly stating that he would be burned to death. The sender was a company boss. Upon hearing of the man's gruesome death, the boss immediately had HR bring over his file. During a previous company team-building event, the victim manager had played a similar childish prank on an employee who couldn't tolerate the humiliation and mockery and quickly resigned. The employee was soon brought in for questioning at the police station, and before Lucifer could use his desire-revealing powers, the employee readily confessed, branding the deceased manager as deserving his fate. Lucifer found the case to be resolved too easily, only to see his mom wandering around the station. Not wanting her involved or their familial connection known, he quickly sent her away. Chloe felt the case had closed too quickly and suspected something was amiss. Her instincts were right. Another confession video and murder occurred. The victim this time was choked to death by a multitude of apples stuffed down his throat like a turkey while tied to a sex frame. The victim, a bank assistant, had been dumped by his girlfriend and in a fit of rage, posted their private SM video on a social network, causing his ex-girlfriend, a primary school teacher, to be fired and later end her own life. The commonality between the two victims was that they had both uploaded inappropriate videos to social networks. Other than that, they had no connection. Lucifer felt the victims got what they deserved and was uninterested in following up. 
Chloe suspected the killer was a pervert from the social network and wanted to see the website's customer login list. Dan came back with bad news. The company refused the request on the grounds of privacy violation. Chloe went to the boss for information and began to suspect that the killer could be one of the network's moderators, who deal with malicious videos daily and might have become repressed and twisted as a result. Just as she was about to enter the moderator's office, she discovered Lucifer was already there. Lucifer had been at the Lux bar, only to realize his mom had become the star of the dance floor. No one wants to see their mother turn into a hot girl. So Lucifer asked his mom to stop dancing her hormones away, but she felt that even as a police consultant on Earth, Lucifer was still fulfilling God's mission to punish sinners. Lucifer was somewhat lost in thought and decided to catch the killer to ask why he punished others, hoping it might enlighten him. Chloe eyed each moderator with suspicion, but Lucifer disagreed. These moderators face various sins every day, but haven't given up on the beauty of life. They wouldn't be the killer. Chloe learned that the boss had previously worked as a moderator and had access to all videos and worked closely with the police. Dan also discovered that the pranks and confession videos could be traced back to the boss's IP. Her office was now empty, leaving Chloe with deep regret. That night, a live broadcast alert from the boss suddenly surfaced on social media. Chloe felt something was off and checked the surveillance video of the boss's escape, only to find out she had been taken hostage by a criminal and there was an accomplice. Dan traced the live stream back to the company's building. Chloe and Lucifer infiltrated the company's server room where the perpetrator was forcing the boss to confess and was about to burn her alive, all because she had created a social network that spread sin and evil. It turns out the person behind all this was the HR director. At the crucial moment, Lucifer jumped into a verbal confrontation, questioning why the HR director felt the need to punish others. The HR director claimed to be a crusader for justice, but Lucifer saw through his deceit. Perhaps he had initially justified the murder of the manager, but after the first kill, the HR director began to take pleasure in the helplessness and pleas of others. Realizing the police were on to him, he tried to pin the blame on the boss to avoid punishment, so he was just as culpable as the sinners he punished. Reflecting on this, the HR director acknowledged his guilt. Just as he was about to take the boss down with him, Chloe intervened in time, putting out the fire. Lucifer knocked out the HR director with a punch. Through this ordeal, Chloe realized that her conflict with her ex-husband Dan should not affect their daughter. Trixie wanted to go camping with the whole family as usual. Meanwhile, Dan realized their separation was meant to resolve marital issues, and he had come to terms with the fact that he could not return to the past. It was better to part ways and find individual happiness. Back home, Lucifer encountered Aminadil. It turned out Mays had always seen Lucifer's mother as a substantial threat. She befriended Dr. Linda, who analyzed the situation and offered sage advice. Since Mays couldn't take on Lucifer's mother herself, she had to find someone who could influence her. Mays enlisted Amina Diel's help, but his powers were fading and his wings were molting. He didn't want Mays to see his destitute state, so he kept up the facade. To prevent Mays from spotting any weakness, he readily agreed to speak with Lucifer. Amina Diel arrived at Lux Bar, not finding Lucifer, but instead encountering his mother. He too is her son, and upon seeing her tearfully playing the role of a devoted mother, he didn't banish her back to hell. Instead, he took a moment to rekindle their familial bond. Lucifer had a plan that would both honor his agreement with God and avoid sending his mother to hell. He decided to trap her in her human form, forcing her to experience human frailty and the challenges of managing both a family and a career. Lucifer thought this was the best solution, but he underestimated his mother's power. The ease with which she easily finished a thug indicated that her divine abilities were not hindered by a human vessel. Recently, Lucifer found a smartphone as his new toy. Even during his therapy sessions with Dr. Linda, he seemed quite absorbed in it. But this was all to cover up his uncertainty about whether he'd handled the situation with his mother correctly. Dr. Linda advised him not to avoid conflict by distracting himself. And what better distraction for Lucifer than a new case? Chloe had just received one. It's a girl found dead in the forest. Chloe wasn't in the best state that day, dealing with her divorce from Dan and having to move out of her mother's house to find a new place while juggling Trixie and work. Lucifer suggested she shouldn't stress too much and should take some time to unwind, perhaps with a drink. The victim girl didn't have any identification on her, but there was a triangular stamp on her wrist, seemingly a pass for entry into some club. There was also a cab at the scene. Chloe managed to track down the cab owner, who revealed that the girl had jumped out of the car mid-ride. When he stopped to look for her, he returned to find her lifeless and panicked, abandoning the car to flee. 
However, the victim had made a phone call during the ride, seemingly to her boyfriend, saying she was going to his place. But he had replied with a threat to kill her if she dared to come. Coroner Ella found the toxin left in the victim's stomach was called scopolamine, a potent organic hallucinogen. This toxin takes at least 90 minutes to take effect. The rideshare driver picked up the girl 30 minutes before the poison manifested, so it couldn't have been him who poisoned her. The police technical department traced the last call made by the victim before her death, which came from a restaurant owner. The owner was married, and the victim worked as a waitress at his restaurant. He had an affair with the victim, but at the time of the crime, he was with another waitress, giving him a solid alibi. Chloe was diligent in her investigation while Lucifer kept trying to get her to relax. But Chloe wouldn't fall for that. Lucifer had to seek Maze's help, and Maze wouldn't help without getting something in return. If she succeeded, Lucifer's convertible would be hers. The restaurant owner provided a clue. The previous night was the victim's besties' night out. She was with her close friends. So Chloe and Lucifer visited the apartment where the girls lived. Their friend, Ginger, helped them open the door, only to find another friend's body dead in the same manner as the first victim. The trail of clues ended there. Lucifer went home happy, but Chloe came to his place with evidence and files to work overtime. Both girls had traces of liquid nitrogen in their stomachs, likely from a cocktail, and the poison was probably mixed in as well. The first victim girl had been seen at a nightclub before the crime, and there was an abandoned building across from the club where parties had been held recently. Chloe asked Lucifer to gather information about the bar. That's when Mays stepped in. She knew the bartender there and suggested they go for a drink. Ella joined in for fun, and Dr. Linda was also invited by Mays. Chloe's questioning at the bar wasn't going well, so the four women started sharing secrets. Dr. Linda paid her way through college by working as a phone sex operator. Ella had once stolen a car, Chloe feared dying alone, and Mays was a fierce demon from hell. Opening up, the four women instantly became friends, toasting together, singing and laughing on stage. Mays took the opportunity to snap a photo and sent it to Lucifer. A drunken Chloe stumbled upon a man with the same club stamp on his wrist. His girlfriend, mistaking Chloe as a hormone rival, started hurling insults at her. Mays couldn't tolerate someone bullying one of her own and brandished her weapon, ready to clear the room. They fell into a chaos while Dr. Linda could only shout bullshits from the sidelines. Eventually, Chloe learned from the man that the abandoned building hosted swinger parties. She sent Lucifer and Dan to go undercover. Lucifer also brought along Amina Deal, who had been living a repressed life lately. As a brother, Lucifer decided to show him some fun. As soon as they entered the party, they realized something was off with the bartender, who took off running because Dan was clearly a cop. The bartender remembered the two girls who had died, along with another blonde girl. He was sure the cocktails he made were clean, but the sleazy old lecher could be the one who caused the trouble. Chloe and Lucifer went to find this lecher, but before that, she saw the photo Maze sent to Lucifer. She thought she had become friends with Maze, only to realize Maze was after Lucifer's convertible. Angry, Chloe unilaterally ended their friendship. But business was business, and Chloe, with Lucifer, found the lecher, who was also mildly poisoned. It turned out that the two victim girls were lured by the blonde girl. They had no idea it was a sex party and were not willing to sell themselves for money. Before leaving, the blonde girl offered them a drink. The old lecher, ever so thrifty, finished their leftovers. Fortunately, the lecher had a group photo from the party night with the girls. The blonde girl turned out to be Ginger with a golden wig. Targeting the suspect, Chloe and Lucifer immediately went to arrest her. Ginger was getting ready to flee. It's revealed that she was from a small town, dazzled by the big city life, and always believed she was meant for a glamorous life. So for money, she lured girls into prostitution. Realizing she was cornered, Ginger took Chloe's sexy body hostage, but Lucifer distracted her, allowing Chloe to give her a beating. The case was closed, and Chloe found herself reflecting on the false sense of sisterhood that had emerged through the investigation. Maze came to make amends, brimming with pride. She wasn't toying with Chloe. Her animosity was truly gone. But now, there were more pressing matters. Chloe needed to find a place to live. Maze, wanting to distance herself from Lucifer, proposed they become roommates since she had the money. Maze turned around and informed Lucifer that she was moving out to live with Chloe. However, she no longer wanted the convertible from him. Before that, she decided to enjoy the pleasure of Lucifer pouring her drinks instead. Amenadiel, burdened with worries, hurried over. 
Lucifer had not sent their mother back to hell, and failing to fulfill this would lead to dire consequences. Lucifer's deal was made to save Chloe's life. If he found a loophole and didn't uphold his end, God could harm or take Chloe's life at any moment. Meanwhile, Chloe was driving when suddenly a car came barreling across and crashed into her side, causing one to wonder whether it was just an accident or an act of God. Lucifer's mom always had the facade of a devoted mother towards her sons, a visage of selfless regret, but it always felt unsettling. She seemed intent on stirring up significant trouble, striving to pull her sons to her side, which sent shivers down the spine. The scene shifts to a man moving a skateboard on the lawn which trips the lady of the house. She scolds her son, who in his anger releases a messy dog. The dog runs into the street and a car swerves to avoid it, hitting Chloe's car. Chloe only sustains minor injuries and the man walks away from the scene, satisfied from a distance. Lucifer is anxious and warns Chloe that this is God's doing. Chloe, of course, doesn't believe this and tells him to stop blaming everything on his parents. Trixie is also very worried. She doesn't want her mom going to work and fears she might encounter danger and never return. Chloe gently reassures her. As expected, a new case arrives. A once famous action movie star is found dead. His addiction to drugs led him to a life of teaching karate to make ends meet. He died around 7 a.m. with no signs of forced entry at the scene, and the murder weapon was a trophy, placed beside merchandise and contracts from the fourth movie in his starring series. Lucifer is a fan of the movie star's films and even wants to take a photo with his body. Ella realizes Lucifer likes the movie star's character because he slaughtered an entire village, and yet everyone supported him, quite the opposite trait of Satan. Lucifer spots the man who caused Chloe's accident walking past a window. When he catches up, he's even more certain it's the archangel Uriel, whose ability is foresight, allowing him to tweak details and push destiny along. Compared to Lucifer's carefree attitude, Uriel is much more serious and dull. He warns Lucifer that if their mother isn't handed over within 24 hours, he will deal with Chloe. Although angels can't directly kill humans, Uriel's ability could lead to Chloe's accidental death. Lucifer enlists Amenadiel and Maze. Mays raises both hands in agreement to hand over their mom, but Lucifer hopes Amenadiel, as the eldest and most powerful and respected of the angels, can either persuade or defeat Uriel. Poor Amenadiel, his fading powers have not yet been revealed, leaving him speechless as he accepts the task. Meanwhile, Lucifer takes up a vigilant watch over Chloe, protecting or peeping at her with no blind spots. Lucifer turned out to be a fan of the movie star, and so was Officer Dan. It's rare for two men who don't get along to share the same taste. Dan brought in a clue. The person who reported the crime saw a car leaving the scene of the murder. From the partial license plate number they remembered, the police found 13 suspect vehicles, one of which belonged to the movie star's ex-wife, the former famous socialite Jamie, who admitted she had gone to see the movie star that morning because he had left her a message about a problem with the fourth movie in the series. However, when Jamie got there, her ex-husband was already dead. At the time of the murder, she was at a yoga class and had no opportunity. But Jamie's identity led to a new suspect, her current husband, Kimo, who had not only stolen Jamie from the movie star, but was also the latter's rival in the movie business. The movie star was the star of the movie series, and Kimo was the newcomer who was soon given his own spin-off series by the company. Jamie revealed that Kimo had been at a book signing in the next city over these past few days, but they found the timing of the signing didn't add up, making Kimo a prime suspect. Lucifer and Chloe staked out and caught him, but Kimo wasn't the murderer. He had fallen on hard times to the point where he was earning money by being a thug for the mob. Lucifer couldn't believe that the impressive chemo from the movies was so timid in reality. He immediately used his magic on him, asking for his desires. Chemo responded he only wanted to make his wife Jamie happy, to earn money for her to spend freely. In fact, Chemo and the movie star were good friends. Their public conflicts were just a publicity stunt to generate attention and money. The two shared everything, of course keeping their friendship hidden from Jamie. Kimo was at a small comic shop doing a signing at the time of the murder. However, the murder weapon had Kimo's fingerprints on it, forcing the police to take him into custody temporarily. He wasn't locked up for long before Lucifer paid to bail him out. Kimo's business manager with fluffy hair expressed his gratitude to Lucifer. Chloe was curious why Kimo, with his blockbuster movies, could be so poor. The fluffy-haired manager explained helplessly how Kimo spent his money on foreign cars, private islands, and even kept a white tiger as a pet. Dan was in the police station, happily taking a photo with Kimo's picture. A true fan indeed. Lucifer looked up and noticed Amina Diel avoiding a direct confrontation with Uriel. 
Initially, Amina Diel sought out their mother, hoping she would voluntarily return to hell. But before he could speak, her outpouring of maternal love left him so touched that he was speechless. He had to find another plan with Lucifer, like hiding both their mother and Chloe until Uriel returned to heaven. Lucifer wasn't on board, so he encouraged Aminadiel not to be timid, reminding him of his reputation established with his fists, suggesting that a mere show of force would have the rest of his brothers falling in line. Aminadiel, not used to such eager encouragement from Lucifer, was swept up by the flattery and set out to bluff as instructed. It had been a while since Aminadiel had looked so sharp. Unfortunately, Uriel saw through Aminadiel's act and beat him up like cutting a piece of shit. Lucifer felt like a weight had been lifted off his shoulders and happily examined the evidence Dan had gathered. The comic shop owner confirmed Kimo's alibi. Dan, motivated by personal interest, had confiscated all the merchandise from the fourth movie under the guise of visual aids for the investigation. Despite this, Dan had his uses. He discovered that the movie star and Kimo's contract with the work only entitled them to 1% of the merchandise profits, while the contract sent by the company stated 10%. They deduced that the missing 9% had been pocketed by the fluffy-haired manager. All that was left was to figure out why Kimo's fingerprints were on the murder weapon. Ella enlightened Dan with a simple observation. The movie star and Kimo had both won awards, each with a trophy. It was likely that someone had switched the two trophies. The only person who could have done so was Jamie, who had been at the scene and might have been in cahoots with the fluffy-haired manager. Chloe went to confront the fluffy-haired manager and Jamie, while Lucifer went home to see the results of Amina Deal's efforts, only to find his big brother beaten into a pulp. Maze was dissatisfied with Lucifer's actions. Amina Deal had no choice but to reveal that his divine powers had vanished. With Uriel still on Earth, Chloe's safety was now a top priority. Beside the sandy beach, Uriel bumped into a pedestrian. Newspapers fell to the ground, and a woman went to pick them up. A girl's ball rolled away, and a worker went to retrieve it, incidentally blocking Kimo's car in the process. As Kimo got out of his car to argue the matter, he spotted Jamie and the fluffy-haired manager cozying up together. Chloe, not noticing Kimo, went straight into the hotel. Uriel watched the scene unfold with smug satisfaction. Chloe accused the manager of murdering the movie star, driven by a message he had previously left for Jamie that had catalyzed this whole mess. Realizing the gravity of the situation, Jamie quickly shifted the blame onto the fluffy-haired manager, claiming he was the murderer. Not to be outdone, the manager blatantly accused Jamie of being an accomplice, having tampered with the murder weapon to frame Kimo. The two were now at each other's throats. In the heat of the moment, Kimo charged out, intent on dealing with the adulterous pair. Chloe stepped in front of him, shielding them using her skinny body. Lucifer arrived with the police. Chloe shared her own experience to console Kimo, recounting a recent car accident she'd been involved in. Although she pretended the accident was no big deal, on the inside, she was actually terrified and longed to return home to her daughter. But as she explained, one can't let emotions disrupt normal life. They can't choose what they experience, but they can control how it affects them and make the right choices. Chloe believed in conquering fate, a notion that also influenced Lucifer. After Amina Deal's mishap, Maze turned to their mother, explaining the situation and urging her to return to hell promptly. The mother's heartfelt confession sparked Lucifer's anger towards God, who always seemed to provide only a vision, never clear instructions. Lucifer questioned why they should be manipulated by God's whims. Guided by their mother's advice, Lucifer confronted Uriel, refusing to hand their mother over. Uriel's precognitive abilities had already revealed that his target was their mother all along. Her seductive powers were too strong. Sooner or later, she would return to heaven, gain God's forgiveness, and then defeat him. If even Lucifer's will was so easily swayed, having resented their mother for years only to be won over in three days, God would be no different. To ensure that this scenario would never play out, Uriel had stolen the Azrael's blade, capable of destroying souls and killing angels, intending to kill their mother and erase her existence permanently. Once again, Uriel threatened Lucifer with Chloe's life, demanding their mother. Lucifer engaged him in a fight, but was quickly knocked out. Maze entered the fray, but Uriel, showing no mercy to a demon, drew the Azrael's blade. Initially, Maze even managed to send the sword flying, but Uriel's precognition was nearly invincible. Soon all of Maze's moves were anticipated, and she was beaten to the ground, powerless to resist. Just as Uriel was about to manipulate fate against Chloe, Lucifer plunged the Azrael's blade into Uriel's body, an outcome Uriel hadn't foreseen. Although Chloe's crisis was averted, Lucifer was thrown into a panic, having killed his own brother. 
His hands stained with the sin of fratricide, he returned home and collapsed into his mother's arms, weeping like a giant baby. Chloe had just started living with Mays, but with their contrasting personalities and tastes, it was inevitable that there would be some friction to work out. Chloe, for instance, wouldn't allow Mays to leave her various toys around the common areas, worried that Trixie might pick up some bad habits. There's no delay when it comes to cases. A bride was shot dead at her wedding, the weapon being a large calorie bullet, likely from a sniper rifle. The shooter first wounded the groom's arm with the first shot, and then a second shot struck the bride in the chest. It was clear that the bride was the intended target. Because of the murder of his brother, Lucifer canceled his therapy session with Dr. Linda and started living a debauched life in a daze. Even when he arrived at the crime scene, he was visibly inebriated. But we know the devil doesn't get drunk. He was just using this appearance to hide his grief. Chloe couldn't stand Lucifer's behavior and questioned whether he even wanted to solve the case. Thinking of the situation, Lucifer stated that the killer must be punished. He used his power on the bridesmaid, forcing her to confess that she wanted to ruin the bride's wedding. She's just too perfect. No one can measure up to her, and it's disgusting. The bridesmaid had given the wedding venue details to the bride's ex-boyfriend, but she didn't expect it would lead to the bride's death. Apart from extracting this confession from the bridesmaid, Lucifer also performed a public kiss with her, planning a rematch for later. Chloe sensed something was off with him, but Lucifer was not willing to open up. Dan had discovered that the bride's ex-boyfriend had a hefty criminal record, including assault charges and illegal possession of weapons. He was now locked in the interrogation room. Lucifer barged into the interrogation room on his own. He intimidated the ex-boyfriend and recorded the confession. It turns out the ex-boyfriend ran away crying after seeing the bride happily getting married, bumping into the wedding musician on the way out. This musician had a buzz cut and was carrying a guitar case. The wedding didn't have a live band, only a DJ. If the ex-boyfriend wasn't lying, then this musician could very well be the shooter, with the guitar case possibly concealing the sniper rifle. Although having a lead is good, intimidating a suspect alone is against the rules. Chloe warned Lucifer that if it happened again, she would kick him off the case. Based on the evidence at the scene, there was a clump of bushes near the wedding that provided an excellent sniping spot. There, a napkin from a well-known food truck was found, suggesting that the killer might have bought some pastries there. Using the food truck's mobile app, Lucifer pinpointed its location. Chloe and Lucifer approached the food truck and asked the owner about the buzz cut suspect. The owner hadn't been working that morning and had no recollection, but the employee remembered the man, who had asked whether the owner was in. In the midst of their conversation, someone shot the owner. Chloe immediately identified the sniper's position on the roof of the opposite building, but by the time they got there, the place was deserted, with only bullet casings left behind. The two cases were clearly connected. The killer had premeditated the murder of both the bride and the food truck owner. He had a hit list, and it was unknown who would be next. Back at the precinct, Chloe pondered the connection between the two victims, while aboard Lucifer opened the snack cabinet for a stealthy treat. True to his style, he took the snack and left money in return. Chloe was about to roll her eyes at Lucifer when she was interrupted by a call from her daughter. Trixie's babysitter had been scared off by something in Maze's room, and now no one was available to take Trixie trick-or-treating on Halloween. The little girl pleaded with her mother to let Maze accompany her. Chloe had prepared a princess dress for her daughter, a wish from when Trixie was seven. But now at eight, she'd changed her mind and wanted a different costume. Maze naturally encouraged Trixie to wear whatever she liked. With Maze's protective escort, Trixie not only got plenty of candy, but even managed to collect some money. Trixie hoped Maze would also wear a Halloween costume, and Maze indulged her by revealing her terrifying demonic true form. Trixie wasn't scared at all. She even thought it was too cool and took Maze's hand. At the police station, the loved ones of the two victims were crying their hearts out. Chloe considered that the killer's target might not actually be the victims themselves, but their partners. The groom and the owner's wife knew each other. The owner's wife was a doctor, and the groom was a lawyer responsible for handling various medical malpractice cases at the hospital where she worked. The killer could be a relative of a patient who was dissatisfied with the hospital, seeking revenge. The list of cases handled by the groom was quickly obtained, but the hospital's medical records couldn't be directly released. However, with Lucifer around, it only took minutes to get the records from the archives. He had stolen Officer Dan's badge and service weapon and swaggered in with them. Dan said that he only does what he wants to do, not what he must. Lucifer retorted that if he only did what he wanted, then this is what he wanted to do right now, and swung a punch. Chloe felt something was off with Lucifer and sent him home to reflect on his actions. 
Dan didn't badmouth Lucifer further. With the records in hand, it was better to get on with the case. Comparing the records and the list, a suspect named Wes drew Chloe's attention. His wife had died of some complex lung disease, and the truck owner's wife was the attending physician. He had accused the hospital of intentional homicide, a claim that was dismissed by the lawyer groom. He had enough motive to harbor resentment against the owner's wife and the lawyer groom to make them experience the pain of losing a loved one. Chloe checked the emergency database and found that Wes had no criminal record. He was a government agent with numerous missions in Mexico attempting to take down drug lords and proficiency in long-range shooting, which fit the profile of the killer. When the police arrived at Wes's home, he was not there. Evidence on his desk showed that Wes had forged an employee ID for a pharmaceutical company. By then, Wes had already arrived at the pharmaceutical company armed. Lucifer returned to the Lux Bar, always haunted by memories of his brother Uriel. He drove out all the patrons, and in the dark silence, he felt like he was the murderer who deserved punishment. Chloe and Dan discovered that Wes's wife had participated in a clinical drug trial at a pharmaceutical company testing a medication for her lung disease. But she was randomly assigned to the control group and did not receive the medication. Objectively, this wasn't the fault of the trial doctors, but Wes definitely wouldn't see it that way. Thus, the spouse of the trial doctor could be the next victim. Normally, they would just need to protect the doctor's wife, but since she was also involved in the work, it was unclear who the actual target was between the couple. Chloe and Dan rushed to the pharmaceutical company. Dan stayed behind to protect the trial doctor while Chloe went downstairs to find the doctor's wife. By that time, Wes had already aimed at the doctor's wife, but Lucifer suddenly fell in front of her, shouting at Wes to shoot him instead. Wes's shots missed, trying to scare Lucifer away. Chloe took the opportunity to locate Wes's hiding spot, and he surrendered without resistance. Lucifer was furious, asking why Wes didn't kill him, but it was because he wasn't Wes's target. This only angered Lucifer more because those victims were not responsible for Wes's wife's death. The blame was not on them. Ashamed, Wes hung his head, knowing he was just looking for a scapegoat, blaming himself for being abroad on missions for so long and not being there for his wife in her time of need. Lucifer mocked his pain as deserved, but Chloe saw that Lucifer had wanted to die and hoped to talk about it. However, Lucifer said that Chloe could never understand, which hurt her, but she still hoped that Lucifer would at least talk to a psychologist. After the case concluded, Chloe returned home to find a comforting scene, Maze and Trixie asleep in each other's arms. It was probably the only solace she had that day. Lucifer heeded Chloe's advice and sought out Dr. Linda again. But when he spoke of killing Uriel, Dr. Linda couldn't comprehend it. She thought it was all metaphorical and hoped Lucifer would be completely honest so she could continue the therapy. Thus, Lucifer revealed his true devilish form to her. Dr. Linda stood frozen in place, too terrified to move. Realizing that his attempt at honesty had backfired, Lucifer could only leave. Uriel's death saddened more than just Lucifer. Amina Deal was also heartbroken. Their mother saw through her eldest son's sorrow and took him to Uriel's resting place. As the oldest, Amina Deal had always shouldered responsibilities. When his brothers erred, he was bound to share their punishment. He obeyed their father God without complaint, but standing by Uriel's grave, Amena Diel lost control. He resented his father for always being aloof and not preventing the tragedy. Their mother encouraged Amena Diel not to suppress his feelings, but to let them out. He had had enough of selflessly seeking his father's favor and sided with his mother. The scene shifts to a backstory where Chloe's father was a police officer and Chloe's movie was about to be released. Her father was distributing tickets to a restaurant owner he knew to support his daughter's career. It was there that he was killed by a robber. The robber was arrested and jailed later, but now had the chance to leave prison for a family visit. Chloe received a notification from the warden and was engulfed in anger. Coincidentally, Lucifer was complaining to her that Dr. Linda had been scared off because he had opened up to her. This time, Chloe didn't accuse Lucifer of never understanding how to care for others' feelings. Lucifer also began to realize his shortcomings and wondered how he could become someone who helps others. Chloe rushed to the prison to confront the warden why a murderer should be allowed out to attend his grandchild's baptism. Perry, the robber, was brought out by the prison guards. Seeing the man smiling made Chloe's skin crawl. She decided to follow Perry after his release. Amidst the tension, Lucifer called, requesting to shadow Dan at work that day. Chloe agreed, telling him not to interfere with her work and to do as he pleased. Chloe drove behind the police car, and in the time it took to turn a corner, the police officers in the car were shot dead. 
Perry was also killed by gunfire. The police arrived at the scene. Lucifer followed Dan, who told him to just follow orders and not cause trouble. Perry's death was clearly an assassination. Chloe was nearby when the incident occurred and was the first to report it. However, her dual role as a victim's family member complicated matters. Even if she was cleared of suspicion, Chloe couldn't be involved in handling the case. Her ex-husband Dan promised to find the killer and solve the case quickly, and Lucifer made a similar pledge. Dan was somewhat annoyed by Lucifer, and they almost got into an argument. Coroner Ella discovered fingerprints on the police car from the prison staff, as well as those of a cellmate, who had previously been incarcerated with Perry. Chloe went home to make sandwiches for Trixie, something her father used to do for her. Having cut ties with Lucifer, Mays would no longer be tending bar at Lux. Instead, she dressed up seductively to interview for a kindergarten assistant position. In her view, dealing with rowdy kids was not much different from handling demons. Little Trixie encouraged Mays to find a job she loved and not to force herself. After Mays left, Trixie went back to her room to play. Unexpectedly, Chloe was visited by Perry's daughter, who thought Chloe had killed her father and came seeking revenge. Chloe managed to dissuade Perry's daughter and obtained a video from her that could prove her father's innocence. At the time of the original crime, Perry was far from the crime scene, recording a video for his daughter, insisting he hadn't killed any police officers. Clearly, Perry had been taking the fall for someone else. On the other side, Lucifer changed into an outfit similar to his ex-partner Dan's. The two quickly apprehended Perry's cellmate who confessed to the murder of the prison guard and Perry. However, he was unable to specify the correct location where Perry was killed. To extract a confession, Lucifer reverted to his devilish persona and used his power, causing the man to confess. The cellmate had spent most of his life in prison and failed to provide a good life for his family upon release. Someone offered him a large sum of money for his family in exchange for taking the blame for Perry's murder. If the cellmate didn't successfully take the blame and go to prison, he wouldn't get a cent. Dan and Lucifer suggested that taking a false confession was a crime too, so they proposed the man be honest with them and they would find him a clueless lawyer. That way he could spend the rest of his life in prison if he wishes. They solved their case and he still got the money. The man accepted the deal. Chloe hurried back to the police station, just in time to cross-reference clues with Dan and Lucifer. Perry's daughter had been receiving money from a fixed account for years, not spending a penny, believing that it would eventually help to overturn her father's case. As soon as the cellmate was caught by the police, his wife's account received a sum of money, also from that very same account. Tracking the account led them to a Russian mob enforcer named Boris, who specialized in taking money to solve problems for criminals. Lucifer and Dan, posing as clients looking to hire a hitman, got in touch with Boris. To make it convincing, Lucifer falsely claimed he was Dan, looking to hire someone to kill Lucifer. Boris told them to go ahead with the killing and he would find someone to take the fall. Dan and Lucifer couldn't help but smile at their successful sting operation. Chloe did not avoid conflicts of interest and threw herself into the investigation of her father's murder case and the current case of someone taking the blame. Neither Dan nor Lucifer tried to stop her. Ella even dug up all the files from Chloe's father's past cases and meticulously went through them again. After Boris was arrested, he remained silent. During Chloe's solo interrogation, she swore as a daughter that if Boris did not cooperate, she would pursue him relentlessly, even if it meant giving up her badge and make his life a living hell. Sensing Chloe's determination, Boris secretly told her that her father had been investigating a case that he shouldn't have been looking into. Dan was worried about Chloe's state of mind, while Lucifer was still conflicted. Dan wanted to discover the secret behind Lucifer's goodness and even followed him after work in secret. Dan was learning improvisation, pretending to be Satan, which irked Lucifer. In truth, both men were envious of each other. Dan envied Lucifer's freedom, and Lucifer thought Dan was the perfect human. Both were carrying guilt and self-reproach. But after opening up, they shared a laugh and Lucifer reverted to his usual attire. Chloe was at home looking through her father's belongings when Mays returned, disheartened by her lack of success in job hunting. Lucifer's appearance provided a perfect outlet for Mays' frustrations, blaming him for taking charge and revealing their true identities to Dr. Linda, who was now too scared to continue being Mays' friend. Chloe interrupted their childish squabble, urging them to focus on finding a breakthrough in the case. Indeed, Lucifer had made a discovery. Chloe had mentioned Perry smiling at her at that time, but Perry had never met Chloe. The smile couldn't have been meant for her. It must have been for the warden. The warden's fingerprints were also found on the squad car involved in the incident, which had initially been overlooked because prison staff were ruled out as suspects. 
But as a civilian administrator, the warden would never have been in contact with the squad car. It seemed that the warden asked Perry to take the fall in the past, but Perry had now regretted it. So the warden had pretended to agree to release Perry, but actually planned to silence him. Chloe notified the police to rush to the prison, but it was too late. The warden had already made his escape. All they could do was issue a warrant for his arrest. Disappointed, Chloe went home feeling like a failure both as a police officer and as a daughter. In a rare display of humanity, Lucifer comforted her using his words but not muscles. However, there was a surprise waiting for Chloe at home. Mays had found the job she'd been longing for, a bounty hunter. She had been struggling to find work, but out of sheer boredom, she managed to capture the escaped prison warden. Mays and Lucifer presented Chloe with the opportunity for vigilante justice, but she chose to handle things by the book. She wanted to be an upright cop, just like her dad. The case closed. Mays collected the bounty from the police department. It was her first real income in the human world, and she couldn't wait to show it off to Dr. Linda, hoping that Linda would see her efforts to fit into humanity and would want to celebrate with her best friend. Dr. Linda was moved by Mays's genuine emotions. Meanwhile, Lucifer was at Chloe's place, sharing the sandwiches she had made. Perhaps due to experiencing a day in the life of her ex-husband, Dan, Lucifer showed rare empathy for Chloe's remembrance of her father. The devil spoke humanely, assuring Chloe that her father would be proud of her. Chloe threw her heavy body into his arms, but without letting go of their smelly hormones. Afterward, Lucifer went to see Dr. Linda. He was grateful for Maze's efforts, and Dr. Linda agreed to resume being his therapist. However, accepting a patient who was Satan required a transition period. After all, she was dealing with the Lord of Hell. The scene shifts to a woman in a pink tracksuit being chased into an alley and stabbed multiple times, dying from her wounds. The daylight murder seemed like a crime of passion, with the killer likely knowing the victim. Ella examined the body and deduced from the injury marks and found blonde hairs. Tourists' cell phone footage captured the act of murder, although the killer's face was unclear, but the weapon was distinct. Lucifer exclaimed in disbelief. In a rush, he, along with Amenadiel and Maze, headed to Uriel's grave, which had been dug up. The body was still there, but Azriel's blade was gone. It was the murder weapon in the recent case. Azriel's blade, a sword that feeds on the desire to kill, could be withstood by angels and deities, but not humans. It would amplify any malice in a human's heart, leading them to kill and could even spark a human massacre. Footprints were left near the grave. Aminadiel and Maze moved Uriel's body to rebury it elsewhere while Lucifer asked Ella to conduct a private examination. He hoped Ella would ask him for a favor in return, keeping things even. So Ella made a small request which shocked Lucifer. Ella is truly a professional, arriving with all her tools ready to take prints from the footprints by the grave. She also discovered traces of burnt paper nearby. She's sure to verify all this evidence thoroughly. With the case in Ella's hands, Lucifer tagged along with Chloe to hunt down the murderer. The victim had worked at a yoga studio, and Lucifer had the victim's blonde colleague compile a list of anyone who had a conflict with the deceased, no matter how minor the friction might have been. Ella's work was making progress, too. The burnt pieces of paper, once restored, turned out to be a map leading to the grave, complete with a law firm's logo. It turns out this involved Lucifer's mom, who was now inhabiting the body of the lawyer Charlotte to blend into humanity, taking over her family and career, and naturally she'd use the law firm to stir things up a bit. When Lucifer confronted his mom, she nonchalantly confessed to sending many people to search for Azriel's blade. She was trying to get the attention of her husband, God. Whether it was Lucifer's fall or Uriel's death, God never responded. This infuriated her, so she decided, if God likes humans so much, let's see if he appears when they start killing each other. Lucifer disagreed with her reckless plan and asked her to hand over the list of people looking for the sword. The mother had no choice but to compromise, as she'd need her son's support for any future schemes. Chloe was busy investigating while Dan complained that someone kept stealing his snacks from the refrigerator. Lucifer arrived, compared the list his mom had provided with the suspects, and quickly identified the landlord as the culprit. The yoga studio was on property owned by the landlord, and the victim had been using his parking spot for a long time. Though it was a minor grievance, it was enough to provoke action when spurred on by Azriel's blade. Chloe noticed that Lucifer had been spending a lot of time with Ella lately, which irked her. Her ex-husband Dan claimed it was just jealousy, but she wouldn't admit to it. Ironically, just as they were about to go arrest the landlord, she unexpectedly asked Lucifer to join her in the car. Lucifer had to rely on Amina Diel and Maze to search for Azriel's blade ahead of time. 
They turned the landlord's house upside down, but found no trace of the sword. Meanwhile, Chloe and Lucifer found the landlord's body at the yoga studio downstairs. Everyone in the studio had died, and the murder weapon was missing. Ella deduced that it wasn't a one-sided slaughter, but rather the victims had killed each other. The only people dead at the scene were the landlord and a student. The yoga instructor was missing and likely fled with the weapon. Soon, the instructor was caught. The schedule showed he should have been teaching a class, but he hadn't shown up and was hiding at home instead. Lucifer suspected the instructor was hiding the sword, and using his power, he forced him to confess that he just wanted a raspberry cream cheese muffin. The instructor then released his corset to reveal a substantial belly. It turned out he'd been indulging in sweets to the point of becoming overweight and was too ashamed to face his students. Just to be safe, Aminadil and Maze searched the instructor's house, and Maze even helped herself to his collection of desserts. Lucifer was close to giving in to temptation and indulging himself, but Ella arrived in a hurry. Otherwise, Lucifer might have ended up with a little belly of his own. Ella found that the footprints by the grave matched the landlord's exactly. Clearly, the things Lucifer had been investigating privately were overlapping with the case, and she demanded an explanation. Lucifer couldn't give a clear answer, so Ella hugged him, trying to hear his heartbeat to determine if he was up to no good, which was exactly when Chloe walked in. Chloe discovered that the substitute teacher was the blonde colleague of the victim, causing Lucifer to realize that the instructor was in danger. Sure enough, when they arrived at the instructor's house, they found the blonde in a daze standing next to the instructor's body, which had a sword plunged into it. She couldn't remember what had happened, but Lucifer guessed she must have had a grudge against the instructor. Despite his chubby appearance, the instructor was a predator who had harassed girls under the guise of his job and even assaulted the blonde colleague. Lucifer felt sympathy for the girl, and when Chloe arrived with the police to make an arrest, testified that the blonde had acted in self-defense and that the instructor had attacked first. In the blink of an eye, Azrael's blade had vanished again. Lucifer started searching the entire house for the sword. Without a second thought, he knew the one who took it could only be Dan. Dan had suspected early on that it was Lucifer who had been sneaking his desserts. Now, he wanted to pin down the culprit with a sweet tooth. Under Lucifer's persuasion, Dan managed to resist the murderous urge of Azrael's blade, giving Lucifer the perfect opportunity to snatch it back. The moment the sword left his hand, Dan reverted to his goofy, clueless self, wondering who the hell he was. Lucifer bamboozled Dan and hid Azrael's blade away. The case came to an end. Chloe was still troubled by the disappearance of the murder weapon and was somewhat displeased with Lucifer's intimate relationship with Ella. At this point, Lucifer asked her if she was jealous and clarified that his dealings with Ella were strictly professional. After some adjustments, Dr. Linda returned to her normal state of mind. Lucifer was thrilled to be able to continue his therapy sessions. Similarly, Lucifer kept up his end of the mutual aid agreement with Ella, accompanying her on a trip to the church. Once all this was done, Lucifer went to settle the score with his mother, who was set on causing trouble to get God's attention, longing for a family reunion back in heaven. This time, Amenadiel also stood in his mother's camp. But Lucifer didn't consider either heaven or hell as his home. Earth was his home. Amidst the argument, Lucifer's rage triggered a reaction from Azrael's blade. Outwardly, their mother chose to back down, but in places unseen by Lucifer, she was quite smug, planning for something no good. The scene shifts. Amenadiel has become a fallen angel. Lucifer doesn't want his brother getting into trouble with their mom, so he books him on a tour group to experience the delights of Los Angeles. But even with Lucifer acting as the tour guide, Aminadiel isn't interested. Lucifer can't understand why his brother and mother are so stubborn about returning to heaven and turns to Dr. Linda for help. Dr. Linda usually focuses on analyzing Lucifer as her patient, using the emotions and reactions of others to assist in her diagnosis. Neither Amina Diel nor their mom see Earth as their home, while Lucifer calls Los Angeles his first home. She suggested that those who call Los Angeles home are either running from something or searching for something. Lucifer ponders this even while working on his cases. This time, the victim is a Los Angeles real estate tycoon whose skyscraper even houses the Lux Bar. The tycoon died from a champagne glass shard piercing his neck, causing excessive arterial bleeding. The crime scene was wiped clean of fingerprints, leaving only the shattered champagne glass. Suddenly, Lucifer receives a text from Mays saying there's trouble at the bar. He rushes back to find out that the tycoon's son, as the heir to the estate, has decided to shut down the Lux Bar and evict Lucifer, infuriating him so much. 
Maze is convinced that Lucifer's mom is behind it all, but Lucifer doesn't believe her and goes to find Amina Deal, who also didn't believe it's their mom's doing. Upon hearing Maze's suspicions, the mother thinks this case could be an excellent opportunity to force Lucifer to join her cause in returning to heaven. Lucifer calls Chloe, believing that earthly problems should be solved by the police. Meanwhile, Ella has managed to piece the champagne glass back to its original form. The fingerprints of the tycoon's son were found on it. Plus, after hearing Lucifer's tattling, it turns out that the tycoon's son began handling the inheritance just an hour after his dad was found dead. This clearly spells trouble. Just a moment before Lucifer arrived at the entrance of the tycoon's company, he was assuring Chloe that he wouldn't use violence to intimidate the tycoon's son. But the next second, the son fell from a height, landing on the roof of a car. Lucifer was speechless, since this definitely wasn't his doing. Witnesses claim he jumped off the balcony himself. Lucifer commented that the guy's useless because he can't even do a proper job at suicide. The tycoon's son was lucky to have survived the fall, albeit with severe injuries. His fiancé was distraught over his condition, and when he woke up, he felt guilty towards her. It turns out the tycoon's business had been in debt for a long time, and the son's rush to sell off all assets was an attempt to avoid the debts. But it wasn't enough to cover the losses, leading him to consider ending his life. The real estate tycoon had drawn up a sales agreement years ago, but never executed it, apparently to torment the buyer. Upon his death, the son quickly brought out the agreement, hence the rapid transaction. During such a severe debt crisis, the fiancé's unwavering support for the tycoon's son should have been touching, but even this moment was disrupted by the indifferent Lucifer. The buyer, who stood to gain from the transaction, was a potential suspect. Having just returned from abroad, she had no opportunity to commit the crime. Lucifer, eager to reopen his bar, tried to use his power on her, forcing her to confess that she didn't want his muscles, but just wanted to destroy everything the tycoon had, including the Lux bar. The buyer was determined to turn the land where Lux stood into a shopping center. Chloe seized upon this detail, warning her not to conceal any evidence about the case, or else the murder investigation could freeze her assets for many years. The buyer compromised, revealing that there were several unaccounted transactions in the tycoon's finances. Lucifer returned to Lux, pondering how to deal with the demolition issue. Watching the demolition workers scurrying around inside the bar, he had a brilliant idea. He led the workers into a wild party, distracting them from their work. Chloe discovered that the funds had been transferred to an illegal detective's account. Upon inquiry, it was found that the tycoon had spent the money to investigate someone, but the specifics were client confidential, and the detective refused to disclose any further information. Just as Chloe wrapped up her investigation, she received a report of an illegal gathering taking place at Lux. It turns out Lucifer's mother had plans to use the bar to create a scene, and indeed, she found someone who could illegally make a bomb to blow up Lux. However, when the criminal realized that many people could die, he backed out. Furious, the mother returned to the bar, pretending to support Lucifer while secretly observing him. The police arrived to shut down the bar, but Chloe managed to bluff them away. Unusually taking Lucifer's side, she didn't stop his raucous protest against the demolition, which made the mother realize that Lucifer seemed to have a special favor for Chloe. Aminadiel, worried that their mom might do something wrong on Earth, followed her secretly. Mays joined in for the fun. Just when they thought the mother would meet with criminals, they saw that her meeting was actually with Officer Dan. She and Dan seemed to get along very well, even wrestling their juicy tongues. Aminadiel felt something disgusting, while Mays was overjoyed, taking the opportunity to snap a photo of his classic reaction, deeming it too good not to capture as a keepsake. They lost interest in continuing their surveillance, and Dan got the chance to be intimate with the mother of all creation. However, throughout the encounter, she kept inquiring about Chloe and even called the bomb maker again after the deed was done. This time, she requested enough explosives to kill just one person. The demolition workers at Lux were all drunkenly merry, and the police wouldn't be coming anytime soon. Chloe finally had the chance to work with Lucifer to dig into the case. She had been searching for a while but couldn't uncover who the tycoon was investigating. The main issue seemed to revolve around the illegal detective. The two of them confronted the illegal detective and discovered that he did more than just investigate employees. He also took on cases investigating engaged couples. The tycoon had hired the detective to find out if his son's fiancé was a gold digger. 
The investigation revealed that the fiancé's love was genuine, but the tycoon simply couldn't stand the girl. He brazenly instructed the detective to Photoshop racy photos of his son's fiancé, hoping to break up their relationship. When faced with police inquiries, the fiancé became flustered. The tycoon's son confessed first, admitting he killed his father. He had impulsively acted, knowing the vile things his father had done. Seeing her beloved take the blame, the fiancé confessed that she was the real murderer. They both fought to claim the title of perpetrator. Even when Chloe reminded them that if they both admitted guilt, they would both go to jail, they were unwavering. Lucifer couldn't understand human emotions. If someone wasn't guilty but confessed, they would have nothing after going to jail. Yet the son and his fiancé were resolute. They had each other. Lucifer was stunned. He no longer fixated on saving his bar from demolition. If it closed, he could open another place elsewhere. Wherever he was, could be home. Chloe brought good news. She had listened to Lucifer's stories about the history of Lux, and with the help of government friends, got it certified as a historical landmark. Developers could no longer demolish it for urban planning. All Lucifer needed to do was buy it back from the buyer. Deeply moved, Lucifer decided to take Chloe out for dinner. But first, he spoke with Dr. Linda, returning to the original question of why he came to Los Angeles, to find home. Linda suggested that Lucifer had already found his truth in Los Angeles, which was Chloe. Now, he wasn't searching, but avoiding. He could show his true self to Dr. Linda, but avoided doing so with Chloe because he cared deeply about how she saw him. Stunned by this realization, Lucifer hid alone in the bar, unable to face his dinner date with Chloe. Chloe left in disappointment, unaware that explosives had been planted under her car. Hiding in the corner, Lucifer's mother was poised to press the detonator. She believed that Chloe was the reason Lucifer remained attached to the mortal world and had to be eliminated. Just at the moment, Amenadiel stopped her, saying Lucifer wasn't a mama's boy, and if he found out that his mother was behind Chloe's death, he would never reconcile with her in this lifetime. The mother was still contemplating an alliance with her sons to return to heaven and naturally did not want to alienate them. She had to give up her plan and find another way to make Lucifer give up Chloe and leave the human realm. Lucifer, feeling cowardly for not keeping his appointment, turned to Dr. Linda for consolation, stubbornly refusing to admit he had chickened out. Linda was not fooled, telling him it was one thing to lie to her, but quite another to deceive himself. Lucifer then went to apologize to Chloe, but she had no time for his excuses. It was the first day of the trial of the warden, the man accused of killing Chloe's father. Lucifer accompanied Chloe and her mother as they awaited the trial's start. Chloe received the unfortunate news. The Russian mob member, Boris, who could have testified that the warden had hired a hitman, had been beheaded and sent to the police station. The warden sat in the defendant's seat, looking smug. To everyone's shock, Lucifer's mother, in Charlotte's body, turned out to be the warden's defense attorney. However, due to the death of a key witness for the prosecution, the trial was postponed to the afternoon. The mother decided to use this trial to show Lucifer Chloe's greasy colors by getting involved in the case. Lucifer couldn't tolerate this, especially after learning that his mom had let slip her intention to kill Chloe, making him unwilling to compromise. When he heard that Charlotte was the defense attorney, even Dan was stuttering. He had just spent some fishy night with this woman. Dan began to suspect that Charlotte had approached him because of the case and feared he might have spilled some details. Determined to find the truth behind Boris's murder and make amends, Dan investigated. The cut on Boris's neck was made with professional cutting tools, and it contained DNA from a special breed of pig. Following this lead, Dan tracked down the butcher shop where the crime had likely taken place. The butcher's wife informed him that a few days ago, an Asian man with a noticeable scar on his neck had forcefully rented the place. The trial resumed in the afternoon, with Lucifer taking the stand as a witness to describe the process of ensnaring Boris. He concluded his testimony with an appeal to the jury to side with justice and convict the warden. Dan also arrived in time to testify, and it seemed like the prosecution had a strong case. However, an unexpected turn of events occurred when Charlotte, during cross-examination, asked Lucifer about the first person to find the body of Perry, who was suspected of taking the fall for the warden. Confused, Lucifer honestly admitted it was Chloe, but the police report stated that it was Dan who first arrived at the scene, leading to contradictory testimonies. Either Lucifer was lying, or the police was incompetent, wrongly accusing the innocent warden of murder. Chloe, being the first to discover the body in Perry's case, was naturally suspicious that Lucifer had leaked the information. With no way to prove his innocence, Lucifer had to find evidence that it was the warden who had ordered Boris's murder. 
Following the lead given by the butcher's wife, Dan investigated the gang. The three went to their hangout. Before meeting with the gang leader, Dan confessed to Lucifer that he had leaked secrets to Charlotte after sleeping with her. Lucifer was furious at the betrayal, and even more so that Dan had slept with his mother. In anger, Lucifer punched Dan into the room. Lucifer struck a deal with the gang leader. The deal was that if they could take down a bald enforcer, the leader would reveal the identity of Boris's killer. Dan looked perplexed, wondering if they were expecting him to fight with his chicken muscles. Since the chicken cop couldn't be relied upon, Lucifer had brought along Maze, the top enforcer from Hell. The cool and composed Maze quickly won the fight with just a few moves. The leader then informed Lucifer that the murderer had been expelled from the gang and gave them the killer's address. Dan and Lucifer, following the address, found Boris's body as well as the body of the killer. It turns out the warden had hired a hitman behind the gang's back to kill Boris and knew that the gang would deal with the hitman themselves. This way, both the witness and the murderer were taken care of, allowing the warden to kill two fat birds with one stone and secure his own safety. Before the court reconvened, Charlotte approached Chloe with a temptation. If she would accuse Lucifer of being a liar in court, she would find a way to make the warden confess. It was a cunning plan to drive a wedge between Lucifer and Chloe. Lucifer prided himself on his reputation, and Chloe wanted the warden to receive the punishment he deserved. Charlotte thought she had the upper hand, but Chloe surprised her. In court, Chloe spoke of Lucifer's many qualities, saying he may have his faults, but a liar he is not. He's her best partner, and she only hopes he can trust her as much as she trusts him. In the end, the warden was acquitted and released, which infuriated Chloe to see such a scoundrel walk free. However, she did not regret telling the truth in court. Her mother also understood her stance and wept at the front door, coincidentally running into Amenadiel. Previously, Amenadiel had come to disarm a bomb that their mother had planted, and when Maze caught him, he tried to lie his way out. But his efforts were insufficient, and Maze warned Amenadiel to first, control their wild mom, and second, stop lying to her. Maze was clearly not to be trifled with. Aminadil sought guidance from Dr. Linda, acknowledging that he should not have lied, especially to someone he cared for. Dr. Linda advised him to apologize profusely, so that's why Aminadil arrived with flowers intending to apologize to Maze. Now he had been having a pleasant chat with Chloe's mother, but upon taking a serious look at her face, Aminadil's expression changed, and he left in a hurry. It turns out 35 years ago, Amenadiel was commanded by their father to bless a childless couple on earth with a miracle, and that miracle was Chloe. Perhaps God had foreseen Lucifer's future and thus arranged for Chloe's birth. Their mother explained to Amenadiel that Chloe was not an obstacle. With her, they could retrieve their wings. Chloe is the key for them to go home. This explains why Lucifer's immortality is affected by Chloe, who can be immune to Lucifer's magic. Lucifer and Chloe are enjoying an intimate atmosphere, blissfully unaware of the schemes of Lucifer's mother and Aminadil. Meanwhile, the infuriating warden has seemingly escaped punishment. Perhaps he has evaded the law, but Dan isn't one to stand by while she's upset. Dan is connected to Russian mob enforcer Boris, whose death surely has the gang irate. Dan and Mays secretly inform the Russian mob about the warden's situation. He is abducted in the middle of the night. Inevitably, the warden has to pay a price. The scene shifts to Lucifer and Chloe getting closer, ready for a tongue massage. But then, a sexy flight attendant interrupts them, not minding a threesome yoga session. Remembering Lucifer's playboy reputation, Chloe says goodbye. After she leaves, Lucifer turns down the flight attendant. Lucifer's mother rushes to the Lux bar early on, urging her son to date Chloe. With his mother's approval, Lucifer is free from any concerns and shamelessly pursues Chloe again. At the crime scene, Chloe insists that she won't mess around anymore and won't give the flight attendant another look. Chloe asked him if he was sure about that. The next second, he finds the said flight attendant is dead as shit. The flight attendant had all her belongings intact, indicating that robbery or sexual assault was not the motive. Threatening texts from a young millionaire were found on her phone. Using the phone's GPS, Chloe and Lucifer locate the young millionaire's beachfront villa, surrounded by bikini-clad beauties. Lucifer's first reaction is to enjoy the scenery, providing Chloe with another reason why they're incompatible. One is a wealthy playboy, and the other is a serious policewoman. They're just not a match. Guided by the directions from a curly-haired man, the two detectives found the millionaire cozily flanked by women. The flight attendant was an employee of his company, and the threatening messages on the phone could also be interpreted as invitations for a hookup. 
The previous night, the millionaire was engaged in a threesome yoga with beauties and had an alibi. Time flew by, and another similar murder occurred. This time, the victim was male. Chloe did not believe it was the work of a serial killer. She said she was pretty sure Lucifer hadn't slept with this guy, to which Lucifer responded she was wrong and the guy had a great body. Chloe underestimated Lucifer's bisexuality. Both victims had sexual relations with Lucifer. Perhaps they were killed by a jealous ex-lover of his. It seemed necessary for Lucifer to list all of his exes. The police station was soon crowded with Lucifer's sexually alluring partners, comparable to a fashion model contest. Dan was almost drooling with envy. Everyone praised Lucifer's seductive prowess, claiming it to be the best night of their lives. However, when it came to emotional investment, it meant nothing. There was no love involved. At first, Lucifer reveled in the adulation until he realized no one cared about his feelings, which left him feeling a bit down. Lucifer's mother showed up uninvited and lavished Chloe with compliments, suggesting that she and Lucifer could develop a good relationship. Dan was nervous, dreading Chloe finding out about his tryst with Lucifer's mother. Lucifer's former lovers provided more than just talk about sex. They revealed that Lucifer had a strange, obsessed fan. This fan's walls were plastered with sneaky photos of Lucifer and his lovers, including Chloe. Such a creepy and obsessive fan surely brought trouble. However, the investigation shows that the obsessed fan was not the murderer but helped advance the case. The two victims were the fan's close friends and they had another friend, a pilot with a history of drug use and assault who now flew private routes. The pilot's recent destinations were all hotspots for drug trafficking. Dan speculated that the pilot was smuggling drugs and had killed the flight attendant and the male victim so as to silence them after they discovered his illicit activities. The pilot was about to flee when Lucifer's wild driving blocked him. Seeing that his pursuer was the police, the pilot actually sighed with relief. It turned out that an individual known as Big Thug had been smuggling drugs into the country. The flight attendant was one of Big Thug's underlings. Not long ago, during a drug transport, she lost a package. Big Thug, suspecting she had pocketed it for herself, took her out. However, the missing goods were still not found. Subsequently, Big Thug targeted the male victim, who was close to the flight attendant. The outcome was sadly predictable. The pilot, not wanting to lose his petty life, had to escape as quickly as possible. Lucifer thought that to catch Big Thug, entrapment might be the best method. Coincidentally, there was a new flight attendant involved in that transport. The plan was to claim she took the goods. The obvious choice to play the role of the new flight attendant was the cool Maze. Why would Maze want to join in? That's a long story. The news of the prison warden's demise at the hands of the Russian mob made the papers. Maze secretly wanted to take credit for it with Chloe, but Chloe preferred to see justice served legally. Dan was also reluctant to admit his clandestine contact with the Russian mob. Feeling that her good intentions were wasted, Maze turned to her confidant, Dr. Linda, for a chat. Linda advised her that regardless of whether the person involved was grateful or not, she did a good deed. Feeling proud of herself was enough for her. That was her reason for helping with the current sting operation. Mays, disguised as a flight attendant, met with Dan and casually dropped the bombshell about his fling with Lucifer's mother. Chloe, who was listening in, was completely flabbergasted. Lucifer chose this moment to profess his innocence, saying he never had that with his mother, suggesting how great he was and that Chloe should consider him. However, Chloe coldly rejected Lucifer and even asked him to get out of the car, needing space to sort out her emotions. Maze was soon approached by Big Thug, but this guy was just an imposter. The real Big Thug had already taken Lucifer hostage at gunpoint. It turns out, the so-called Big Thug was the curly-haired man, and the lost package wasn't drugs, but something far more terrifying and valuable. Lucifer revealed his true nature and thoroughly intimidated Big Thug. Chloe and the team arrived just in time to save the suspect's life. Big Thug was caught, but the package was still missing. At a private airport, a mysterious man got hold of the package, which contained many vials of liquid. The person who stole it was the same millionaire who accidentally got some on himself, causing him to bleed from the mouth and nose. The mysterious man strangled the millionaire without mercy and left with the goods. After this incident, Lucifer felt that Chloe deserved someone better and that he wasn't worthy of her. Upon hearing this heartfelt confession, Chloe didn't hesitate to kiss Lucifer, but without using her tongue. They passionately kissed from the beach all the way to Lux, with devil horns suddenly sprouting from Lucifer's head. Chloe was so thrilled she couldn't pull herself away. However, it turned out to be just a wet dream of Chloe's. Lucifer shared his progress with Dr. Linda, who thought that Lucifer had conquered Chloe, but he believed that Chloe's immunity to him had failed, and he wanted to test it. Dr. Linda didn't even know where to begin her critique. 
Afterward, Lucifer had just met up with Chloe and tried his power on her, but naturally, it was futile. He thought that she was still the woman who intrigued him, but then Chloe slapped Lucifer's backside, indicating something is wrong with her. Actually, Mays had advised Chloe to relax once in a while to add a bit of humor. Being a stern-faced cop all the time was exhausting, and there it was. Chloe's first little surprise was used on Lucifer. Although it was surprising, it wasn't exactly pleasant. The latest victim was a male university student bleeding from his eyes and nose, his skin wrinkled. He died of poisoning within the past 24 hours. His roommate disclosed that a well-known male actor sought him out yesterday. Now that same actor, knife in hand, has appeared before the police, exclaiming that the student's death was his fault. The actor received a video yesterday from a masked individual presenting a grim choice. Scar his face with a knife, or let the student die from poisoning. Relying on his looks for a living, the actor couldn't bring himself to do it, dismissing it as a prank. But now, the student is truly dead. Chloe traced the video to an abandoned email account, now used by the perpetrator to send threatening messages under the guise of participating in an experiment. An hour ago, the masked figure sent another video, this time forcing a renowned thoracic surgeon to choose, maim her own hand, or see a female student killed. The police dispatched Dan to protect the surgeon while attempting to save the female student, whose poisoning proved difficult to counter. To save the student's life, the surgeon resolutely sacrificed her hand, and the culprit delivered the antidote. Ella discovered that the first poisoning victim was the millionaire who died at a private airport. Obviously, the goods Big Thug lost were poisons, specifically designed, which meant the antidote required special design as well. According to the female student's testimony, the victims were likely poisoned while receiving a flu vaccine, casting suspicion on the medical van's doctor. Previously a university professor, he fled the scene of a car accident involving the taxi he took, pushing away the taxi driver seeking help to retrieve his own dissertation before escaping. Moments after he fled, the taxi exploded, killing the innocent university student who was a part-time taxi driver. Following the release of this video, the professor was abandoned by his wife and lost his job, leaving him to work solely in a medical van. His current madness is an attempt to prove that when faced with life-or-death decisions, everyone prioritizes their own interests over the lives of others. This deranged killer's target range is vast, equating himself with successful individuals like the actor and thoracic surgeon, revealing his immense ego. Lucifer and Chloe took the initiative to insult him, calling him nothing more than a filthy, pitiful vermin, and sure enough, the killer took the bait. He refused to acknowledge the surgeon's selfless act, believing sacrificing her own hand was only for show, done for societal reputation because she was being watched. Now he has moved the experiment to his own turf, challenging an athletic star to see if he would cut off his own leg to save a student's life with two lives hanging in the balance. Meanwhile, Ella found a video of the killer entering the private airport, and Chloe spotted the killer's access card, leading them to his hideout. By the time Lucifer and Chloe reached the lab, the killer had posed a deadly choice for them. The lab was filled with poison gas, and the antidote for the student was inside. Chloe could risk poisoning herself to retrieve the antidote or let the student die. Lucifer instructed Chloe to chase the killer while he would save the person. Lucifer kept cutting his arm with shards until Chloe had chased the killer far away and no wounds appeared on his arm. He then charged into the lab. Watching Chloe in pursuit, the killer mocked her for being selfish. His experiments were to prove that selfishness is human nature. Now afraid of being caught, he chose to end his own life. Chloe rushed back to the lab where both the student and the athletic star were alive and Lucifer was unharmed. Chloe embraced him without tongue massage, and it was then Lucifer felt Chloe truly loved him. Things seemed to be going well between Lucifer and Chloe until Lucifer's mom decided to stir things up. She first approached Dr. Linda, hoping to pass on a message to Lucifer. Dr. Linda refused, saying she knew she was up to no good, and told her to get lost. Lucifer's mom turned to Mays, who hesitated but eventually agreed to meet with Lucifer. At the bar, Lucifer was ecstatic, declaring that he and Chloe were truly an item now. He said Chloe was not his weakness, but she made him invincible. Maze, seeing Lucifer so happy, didn't want to reveal the truth. Lucifer's mom insisted it's for his own good, all for him. During the argument, Lucifer saw a photo on the bar wall from 35 years ago of Amenadiel and Chloe's mother. Lucifer's mom took the opportunity to clarify that Chloe was a gift from God to the Decker family 35 years ago. God had foreseen Lucifer's arrival on Earth, and Chloe was his pawn. Lucifer's so-called destiny was still at God's mercy. 
Reflecting on their sweet moments together, Lucifer was devastated. He rushed to Chloe's house to confront her if she knew she was sent by his dad to mess with him. But what he found was Chloe, her nose bleeding profusely, just like the poisoned university student before her. And the only person who knew the antidote formula was now dead. Let's summarize the relationship between the protagonists up to this point. 35 years ago, God sent Amenadiel to bless the Decker couple who were unable to conceive, allowing them to have Chloe. According to Lucifer's mother, it's likely that God had anticipated Lucifer's rebellion and descent to Earth, thus creating Chloe to guide Lucifer's life. Lucifer's mother encouraged a relationship between Lucifer and Chloe, planning to reveal to her son at the height of their romance that it was all God's arrangement, because she knows Lucifer detests being manipulated by his father, and knowing the truth would likely lead him to sever ties with God. If he can't find peace on earth, he might as well join his mother's ranks and return to heaven. According to his mother, Chloe is the key to their return to heaven. She can provoke Lucifer into a rage. Due to God's blessing, Chloe remains unaffected by Lucifer's charm and power. The scene shifts to Lucifer in a frantic state, speeding to get Chloe to the hospital. In a struggle with the paramedics, Chloe is accidentally injected with poison. This particular poison can only be cured with a corresponding antidote. Chloe, not wanting to cause panic, insists Lucifer take her to the police station. Ella discovers that there are no other victims of poisoning, and the versions of the poison and the formulas for the antidote have been destroyed by the medical van doctor. Chloe has only 24 hours left. Lucifer suspects this is yet another of God's arrangements and demands the antidote from Amenadiel, who has no knowledge of it or Chloe's poisoning. Their hopes rest on Big Thug, who's involved in transporting the poison but has never seen the antidote. However, he revealed that the intermediary who introduced him to the business might have a lead. Before they can find this intermediary, Chloe collapses, exposing her poisoning. Dan decides to continue the investigation with Lucifer. The intermediary uses his paintings as a front. Buyers pay large sums for the art but are actually purchasing contraband. Dan instructs Lucifer not to cause any trouble and to follow his lead. But within one round, Dan fails, and they are both captured by the intermediary, with Dan taking a beating. Lucifer quickly knocks out the intermediary with a single punch. Lucifer uses his power to force the man to reveal what he truly wants, promising to fulfill it. The smuggler's dream is for his paintings to be appreciated rather than discarded by the dealers. Lucifer grandly purchases all the paintings, vowing never to throw them away, and secures the list of ingredients needed for the antidote. However, the specific formula is unknown, and random mixing could be lethal. Only the one who knew the exact formula is dead. Lucifer's mother visits to comfort him, inspiring Lucifer with a euphemism for dying. So he plans to die temporarily, descend to hell to get the formula from the medical van doctor, and then resurrect himself. Dr. Linda had a medical background and was tasked with reviving Lucifer. When Lucifer inquired who wished to kill him, both Mays and Amina Deal raised their hands. Lucifer assured that he would secure the formula, entrusting Dan and Ella to concentrate on acquiring all the necessary ingredients. Now, only one chemical component remained, exceptionally rare and challenging to obtain. There were no legal avenues left. They had to resort to the black market. Street racers would often mix the component into their fuel. Ella, with a past that included car theft, was aware of an underground chop shop. As fate would have it, the chop shop's owner was none other than Ella's brother. Though they had grown apart, familial bonds prevailed and the brother handed over the materials to her. Amina Deal took on the duty of protecting Chloe, ensuring she didn't leave the hospital room. Dr. Linda and Mays infiltrated the hospital in disguise, commandeering the room beneath Chloe's. Only by staying this close to Chloe could Lucifer's immortality be suspended, allowing him to die. Neither Dr. Linda nor Mays could bring themselves to do it, so in the end, Lucifer used a defibrillator to electrocute himself. Back in hell, Lucifer found the room where the dead doctor was imprisoned. Inside, the scene of the doctor failing to save lives played over and over again. Once the doctor ran off, everyone swarmed to accuse him, letting him be continuously tormented by guilt. This was hell's punishment, only ending when one's sins were atoned for. However, hell had seen no such success stories to date. Lucifer hinted that if the doctor could write out the antidote formula and save Chloe, he might be able to atone for his sins and escape hell. Without hesitation, the doctor wrote the formula. As soon as Lucifer got it, he vanished from the crowd that was accusing the doctor. One might think that was his ticket out, but no such luck. Lucifer, now knowing the formula by heart, was inexplicably drawn to a certain room where his brother Uriel was sitting. 
Trapped by the laws of hell, Lucifer was forced to relive the scene of killing Uriel repeatedly. He was consumed by guilt and unable to escape. Uriel reminded Lucifer that it wasn't just about killing him, but also about disregarding his last words. Uriel's final words were, Peace resides here, a meaning Lucifer hadn't yet deciphered. Back on Earth, Dr. Linda and Mays couldn't find a way to bring Lucifer back. Lucifer's mother appeared just in time. Despite her reluctance to return to hell and not wanting her son to be trapped there, she was determined to help. Mays used the defibrillator on Lucifer's mother, sending her to find Lucifer in hell. She found him eventually and helped him break free from the torment of Uriel's memory, yet she herself became locked by the rules of hell. She confessed to Lucifer, exploiting his love for Chloe to stir his anger towards God, and then found herself caught in her own grief over Uriel's death. Lucifer couldn't concern himself with that now. Saving Chloe was his priority. He forcibly dragged his mother away, and Dr. Linda, just in time, used the defibrillator to revive both Lucifer and his mother. Chloe's condition worsened, and Amina Deal watched over her unwaveringly until Lucifer returned. With the formula and the materials in hand, Chloe was safely detoxified, having walked the line between life and death. Gently, Chloe told Lucifer that they could have a proper talk afterwards about their relationship. Lucifer, however, did not respond. His heart was hurt by the machinations of his father, God, and his mother, and he decided to leave. All that he left behind for Chloe was the empty rooftop of Lux. Two weeks have passed since Lucifer's disappearance, leaving his mother feeling lonely and helpless. Maze seized the opportunity to mock her, suggesting that Lucifer wouldn't just give up and was likely plotting something in secret. At this moment, Lucifer was indeed sitting in front of a counterfeit godfather, spending a fortune on something mysterious. Everyone felt remorse over Lucifer's absence. Chloe was inwardly angry but maintained a nonchalant facade while seriously working on a new case. The victim was a band's lead singer, and the other band members suspected his ex-wife was behind his death. As Chloe was preparing to interrogate the ex-wife, Lucifer made a grand return, not alone, but with his new trophy lover, Candy. Candy was flaunting a huge diamond ring, the very item Lucifer had splurged on from the counterfeit godfather. Candy seemed overly sweet and not too bright, having been an exotic dancer before her marriage. Chloe struggled to hide her inner turmoil and went to question the lead singer's ex-wife, who had a history of domestic violence but wasn't the murderer of her husband. The domestic incident had been an accident, and she had an alibi for the time of the murder. She suspected the marriage counselor had committed the crime. The counselor had been ineffective in saving the singer's marriage and had later helped the singer secure most of his ex-wife's assets in the divorce, yet the singer still lived a frugal life. The question was, where did the money go? What's more, evidence pointed to the counselor being at the crime scene. Lucifer, shamelessly wanting to continue working cases with Chloe, was kicked out of the police station. He then turned to Dr. Linda for advice with Candy in tow. Candy was undeniably cute, mentioning she had been fired but kept working and made herself bigger. When Dr. Linda inquired if she meant making herself indispensable, Candy cheerfully replied that she got breast implants, which totally expanded her horizons. Dr. Linda didn't need to diagnose this one. Lucifer found inspiration in Candy's words. Even if he was fired, he could still keep working. On the case front, the marriage counselor was keeping tight-lipped, and nothing could be gleaned from Officer Dan. Lucifer had a bright idea to book a marriage counseling session for himself and Candy with the intent of going undercover to elicit a confession. Chloe was having none of it, promptly sending Lucifer and Candy away again. With no other options, Lucifer had to take his trophy lover back to Lux. Lucifer's mother was not at all impressed with the sexy Candy, who couldn't understand why, but warmly interacted with her. The mother couldn't believe that Lucifer would actually date a busty but brainless mortal, and was convinced he was up to some grand scheme. She tried to fish for information while pretending to go shopping with Candy, resulting in a conspiracy theorist meeting a naive sweet girl, which ended in complete defeat for the mother. With guidance from Amina Deal, the mother began to realize that maybe Lucifer was genuinely heartbroken and had given up on himself. On the other hand, Mays helped Chloe realize she could disguise herself as Candy and do the marriage counseling with Lucifer to obtain the confession herself. Chloe, dressed up to look like Candy, was slightly cringeworthy. Seizing the opportunity, Chloe vented her anger about Lucifer's departure and sudden marriage to a blonde. Setting emotions aside, she got the counselor to confess. It turns out the counselor hadn't embezzled the lead singer's money. He was a fan and future manager of the band. Thanks to Lucifer's power, he revealed his deepest wish was for the band to become hugely famous, claiming the band members were the best. 
The lead singer's money had all gone into promoting records, leading to his frugal living. The counselor told Chloe that his presence at the crime scene was to mediate a dispute among the band members, as the lead singer wanted to fire the bassist, who had a history of violence. The shape of the fatal wound on the lead singer resembled the knobs on the bass guitar. Chloe followed the lead to a rock venue, and Lucifer also ended up there, even performing a song to seek Chloe's forgiveness. Initially feeling embarrassed, Chloe was eventually moved by the gesture, especially when they caught the fleeing bassist. The bass guitar indeed had the lead singer's blood on it, but the bassist had an alibi. She ran at the sight of the police because she was involved in forging documents. At the time of the murder, she was filming a video with a client, which Dan happened to see, featuring the band's drummer. The bassist explained that the drummer was responsible for packing up all the instruments, including her bass. Chloe finally got Lucifer to join her on a case. Upon entering the suspect's house, who happened to be the band's drummer, Lucifer was immediately taken hostage. He seemed utterly helpless in the situation. It turned out the drummer had accidentally killed the lead singer. After the band became famous, the lead singer wanted to go solo, leading to a heated argument between the two. In the scuffle, the drummer hit the lead singer with the bass guitar, resulting in his death. Chloe had to shoot the drummer to save Lucifer from a dire fate of being strangled. Dan rushed to the scene when he heard the news, and upon finding out Lucifer was unharmed, he embraced Chloe in gratitude, acknowledging her as a really sweet girl. He also let slip that Lucifer always talks about Chloe's little secrets, leading to her finally forgiving Lucifer. With the detective work out of the way, Lucifer had to face his mother. Amina Deal saw through Lucifer's charade. He was worried God's plan would harm Chloe and had brought Dan as a shield. Since this was all part of Lucifer's defiance against God, he should explain it to his mom. The mother was devastated, thinking she had driven her son to despair and was preparing to write an apology letter. Following Aminadil's advice, Lucifer was honest with his mom, admitting he still harbored resentment towards her, but hated God even more. The mother had her own confession to make, prompting a triumphant smile from Lucifer. She revealed that when Lucifer's rebellion failed and he was cast out to hell, it was because he lacked a certain weapon, the flaming sword that guarded Eden, which could pierce anything, including the gates of heaven. God had destroyed the sword, but she informed Lucifer that Azrael's blade was actually the flaming sword. Armed with this crucial information, Lucifer turned to say goodbye to Candy, who wasn't really the ditzy blonde with big breasts, but a smart girl with stellar acting skills. Lucifer had hired her to play a role for everyone, to facilitate his own plan to coax the truth out of his mom about her grand scheme. Before leaving, Candy advised Lucifer not to mess up his relationship with Chloe. Lucifer could only respond that he would try his best. Lucifer clearly had his own agenda. He believed Chloe was a pawn sent by God, and fearing she might be used and hurt, he chose to distance himself. But then again, considering God is all-knowing and all-powerful, perhaps this too was part of his plan. Lucifer's mom confirmed Azrael's blade was indeed the flaming sword when she saw Lucifer's rage made the sword glow. She believed that the sword could be ignited if Lucifer felt intense anger. However, Lucifer wasn't angry enough and needed to control his emotions. He immediately sought help from Dr. Linda, but even a therapist isn't all-powerful. Her expertise is in helping patients express their emotions, but she rarely gets to see his true feelings. Chloe was still bothered by Lucifer's sudden elopement, but cases don't stop for personal issues. This time, the victim was Debbie, an admissions director at a prestigious private school known for helping students with emotional self-control. She was stabbed to death from behind with a commemorative pair of scissors from the school. Lucifer found this intriguing and started pestering the principal with questions. The principal wanted to tout the harmonious relationship between the school and the parents, given its focus on emotional control, but Chloe's sharp interrogation skills broke through. Debbie had recently had a conflict with a pair of parents whose child was denied admission. They had left a stern warning that they would get back at her. The conflict started when Debbie hinted at a donation to the school, but after they donated, she claimed the money never arrived and still refused their child's admission. The police found the murder weapon at the parents' workplace, but Chloe sensed something was off and decided to look into the donation issue. However, she was also rushing to drop Trixie off at school. Lucifer appeared just in time and took over the task. However, offering unsolicited help means he's up to something. To attend the school's emotional class, one must bring a child for the experience. And there's Trixie, all ready to go, with Lucifer playing the part of a makeshift dad. Chloe and Dan were also questioning the principal at the private school. The principal, a bit of a fool, actually thought the parents killed Debbie over the money, confessing he had misappropriated the donations. 
He had no spare cash, and once he heard it might not have been the parents, he changed his tune, suggesting that they should forget what he just said. His chicken cries attracted the P.E. teacher, who recognized Chloe, mentioning her husband, who had just been there with their daughter. The two were baffled, and Chloe immediately thought of Lucifer's antics. Lucifer was in the middle of an emotional class with Trixie. The emotion coach, surrounded by kids and accompanied by her own son, showed no interest in teaching adults. But Trixie confessed she was always worried about her mother's dangerous job, even though she pretended not to care. Lucifer didn't have any ideas, but he turned out to be useful after all. A boy sitting nearby was drawing a picture of his own mother killing Debbie. When Chloe showed up, Lucifer, feeling guilty, blurted out that he had solved the case. The task of investigating the boy's mother was handed over to Dan. Chloe tried to have a heart-to-heart -heart with Trixie, but the girl refused to open up. Back at the precinct, Chloe received an invitation to a memorial service from the private school. Perhaps the open-hearted discussions in class could be an opportunity for Trixie to transfer schools, but Chloe had work to handle first. It turns out that the boy's mother wasn't the murderer. She just really despised Debbie, cursing her every day. Debbie had a knack for causing anxiety among the parents, making them feel inadequate, which in turn upped the prestige of the school's administration. At the time of the murder, the boy's mother was having an affair with the P.E. teacher. Many parents had their flings with this not-so-bright but physically gifted man. To find the person who truly hated Debbie, the boy's mother suggested Chloe look for leads at the memorial service. Chloe was anxious about the service as it might be a good opportunity for Trixie's admission. Mays thought Trixie getting into this prestigious school would be a piece of cake. With fancy parents and rich kids, they're just like vipers. Trixie would learn how to talk back and shut them up, and then she would teach her how to torment them. Chloe, however, didn't think this was okay. As a friend looking to support Chloe, Mays decided to disguise herself as Trixie's other mother to infiltrate the memorial service. Now the playing field was leveled. Trixie had a set of real parents and a pair of fake ones. The event, ostensibly a memorial for Debbie, was actually a social networking party. The parents were like warriors on the battlefield of fame and fortune. They all shared a little hobby, gossiping about other parents behind their backs. Chloe found an angle to work, spread a rumor about Debbie's death to trip up the killer. Mays immediately started a rumor that Chloe had the murderer's DNA in a car outside. The parents promised to keep it a secret, then turned around and told the next one not to tell anyone else. It was like a scene straight out of Gossip Girl. When the emotion coach heard about the situation, she hurried toward Chloe's car. Lucifer had just arrived to attend the memorial service, unaware of what was going on. He thought the emotion coach was there to help Chloe retrieve something from the car and promptly opened it for her. Of course, there was no DNA evidence inside, but Chloe's gun was there. The emotion coach realized she'd been tricked and brandished the gun, causing everyone to back off. Lucifer ended up surrendering alongside Chloe with his hands up. Once the case was explained, it became clear that years ago, the emotion coach had an extramarital affair with the P.E. teacher for one night, which resulted in the birth of her son. Debbie had discovered this secret. She fancied the P.E. teacher and despised all the mothers who had been with him. So she used this leverage to try to get the coach abandoned by her husband and left with nothing. In a moment of desperation, the coach ended up killing Debbie. Chloe tried to persuade the coach to stand down, but luckily Mays was there and tackled the problem head on. The crowd sighed in relief, with only the clueless P.E. teacher left out of the loop, exclaiming that it sounds great for him to be a dad. This elite private school didn't seem so reliable after all. Back at home, Chloe had a sincere heart-to-heart -heart with Trixie, finally getting her daughter to open up. They both agreed on not attending this private school. Lucifer had been busy all day trying to find a way to control his emotions and induce anger. Even arguing with Amina Deal and being ambushed by his mother had no effect on him. He once again sought the help of Dr. Linda, but this time he told the truth. He was preparing to use the flaming sword to open the gates of heaven and lock his mother in there, letting his parents destroy each other because he hated they controlled his life. Dr. Linda saw that Lucifer wasn't angry, but heartbroken and in pain. Maybe only by confronting these emotions could he control the flaming sword. As Lucifer held the sword and tried to feel these emotions, flames indeed sprouted from the blade. His mother was delighted, but Amenadiel saw the tears in his brother's eyes. The flames quickly died out, indicating the sword was not complete. Their mother, increasingly agitated, left the scene. 
Alone, she tore at her wounds, revealing that Charlotte's physical body was starting to fail to contain her energy. After the incident at the private school, Mays began to stick to Chloe, which was a bit too much for her to handle, prompting Lucifer to urge Mays to spend more time with him. But Lucifer wasn't interested. He found solving cases far more entertaining. The victim in this new case was hit in the back of the head with a backgammon board, and the crime took place in a mental hospital. The first person to discover the body was a patient claiming to be God. Now, Lucifer was intrigued and wanted to have a chat, thinking this guy was just posing as God. Lucifer tried to use his power to expose the fake God, but he got nothing. Lucifer couldn't be bothered with the madman anymore, but as he was leaving, the madman actually called out his name. Lucifer hadn't introduced himself to the man, so he began to suspect this might actually be his father, God, and immediately sought out Amina Diel for advice. Amina Diel didn't believe God would come to Earth, thinking it was just the ravings of a lunatic. Ella found fingerprints on the back of the victim's head that belonged to the madman. This madman had declared himself to be God a few months earlier and was committed to the mental hospital by his wife. Lucifer was eager to prove that the man was the murderer, which would confirm he was a fraud. Official procedure was required to question the madman, but Lucifer couldn't wait that long, so he checked himself into the hospital as a patient. Lucifer followed the madman, thinking he was about to kill an old lady, only to find him saving her. It looked like he might truly be God, but Lucifer punched the man first anyway. Chloe was speechless about Lucifer checking himself into a mental hospital, but she thought it did help the case. They learned from the old lady who had been revived that the attacker was dressed as Santa Claus. Once Lucifer confirmed it was the real God, he went to confront his father about everything from being banished to hell to interfering in his life, much like his mother, controlling his existence. Lucifer demanded an apology from God the Father. God was just surprised to learn that his wife was also on Earth, and seeing that God still had feelings for her, Lucifer devised another brilliant plan to punish his parents, grinning like a mischievous teenager. So Lucifer planned escape from the madhouse to arrange a meeting between his parents. He led the mental patients in a riot, sneaking away with God in the confusion. At the back door was an unfortunate Dr. Linda, who got caught up in the chaos and helped them escape. Lucifer cunningly set up a date for his parents, leaving Dr. Linda dumbfounded. But Lucifer believed that after a brief honeymoon period, they would start tormenting each other just like they always did. Charlotte confronted God as soon as she arrived, displaying the anguish of the eggs. Yet swiftly, God's kindness melted her heart, and they began dancing their hormones away. It was supposed to be a punishment, but Lucifer, observing his parents in harmony, couldn't help feeling nostalgic. Just as God was about to kiss Charlotte, Chloe and her team arrived to take God back to the mental hospital. It turns out Ella had found a white hair on the victim, which matched the Santa Claus lead. It's then revealed that in order to get information about the patients, Chloe thought of seducing the hospital's chief physician. Mays played wingman in matchmaking Chloe and the physician, so Chloe arranged a meeting with the physician with Mays and Amina Deal looking on. Amina Deal was there to say goodbye. They would soon return to heaven. When Mays heard Lucifer might leave her behind, she exploded with anger. Just as Chloe and the physician started talking, they received news of chaos at the mental hospital. Two patients had escaped. Chloe had to rush to bring them back. Chloe apologized to the physician who was understanding. Not only did he not blame her, but he also allowed her to examine the medical records of the patients. They found a photo of Santa Claus, and with the physician's help, they searched the hospital and found the Santa costume missing a hat and a white beard. Lucifer was apprehended for escaping the mental hospital and had to be medicated upon return. Since Chloe was at the hospital, the medication had an effect on Lucifer. In his confusion, he was captured by Santa Claus and taken to the storage room that had been converted into an operating theater. God had already been brought in. This Santa Claus turned out to be a nurse. Chloe managed to lift fingerprints from the box where the costume was stored. Ella locked down the fingerprints as belonging to the nurse. At that moment, the nurse revealed that she had been manipulated and humiliated by her mother for most of her life. Therefore, once the nurse had the means, she changed her name and stayed close to her old mother in disguise, tormenting her with various medications. When the victim discovered the nurse's actions and tried to report her, the victim was silenced permanently. Now, God and Lucifer might have realized they were being tracked and decided to put on a show. They planned to have God kill Lucifer and then use a belt to stage a suicide. While the nurse was busy, Lucifer still demanded an apology from God, who granted it with great magnanimity, making Lucifer proud and moved. Chloe arrived just in time to rescue these two helpless men. 
In the ensuing chaos, the nurse tore off God's belt, causing the madman to suddenly come to his senses. Lucifer, looking at the belt buckle, realized that Uriel's last words were not about the piece, but rather the pieces of the flaming sword. It turns out God had dismantled the flaming sword, creating Azrael's blade from its main part, and a piece that became a belt buckle that fell to earth, which the madman obtained. The divine power from the belt buckle possessed the madman, and he truly believed he was God. However, both the belt buckle and Azrael's blade are only parts of the flaming sword. Another piece is still missing. Charlotte kissed the madman using her tongue and knew he wasn't the real one. On Earth, her sons have their own lives, and she misses her husband while also harboring resentment towards him. The crisis of her physical body not being able to contain her divine energy left her feeling helpless, with only Dan having given her a hug. Consequently, Charlotte sought muscle comfort from Dan again. Lucifer politely bid farewell to the madman. Indeed, he was touched by God's words, but it also made him realize that the real God would never apologize to him. Therefore, he wouldn't abandon his plan to send his parents to destroy each other, comforting his wounded heart. The scene shifts to Charlotte enlisting the help of a smuggler to find a missing piece of the flaming sword. Lucifer, fearing his mom is too naive and sweet for the deceitful ways of Earth, worries she'll be swindled and embarrassed. Amenadiel breaks the bad news to his brother that Maze is now furious because their mom handed a large sum of money to the smuggler, Chet, and the sought-after piece hasn't been acquired yet. Before it could be secured, Chet is murdered, and the item vanishes without a trace. They must find the killer to have any chance of retrieving the missing piece. Fortunately, Lucifer's consultant status comes in handy. Lucifer and his mom team up to trick Chloe by claiming they heard gunshots when answering Chet's call. Chloe arrives at the crime scene to confirm Chet's murder. Chet, on the surface, was a manager of an import-export company, but in reality he was an underling of the notorious smuggling queen, Bianca. The police have been closely monitoring Bianca, looking for an opportunity to take her down and her crew. Based on the crime scene, Chet was shot in the leg and fatally in the chest, suggesting the shooter was an amateur, and they even left their phone at the scene. However, smartphones are locked with passwords, and unlocking this one will take some time. Ella uses the phone's branding to search for a music distribution website, which turns out to be a front for only releasing Bianca's son's music. Unfortunately, his rap skills are so lacking that everyone wishes they could unhear it. Bianca has always prevented her son from getting involved in illegal activities. Perhaps killing Chet was her son's way of protesting against her mother. Cracking the phone and handling the son might just take down Bianca's business. Coincidentally, Lucifer's mother, in her life as Charlotte, was Bianca's collaborating lawyer. She receives an invitation to Bianca's party today. Lucifer wants to take Chloe, but his mom would rather go with Dan. After some consideration, the unique duo of Charlotte and Chloe is formed. At the party, Chloe is stunningly dressed, catching Charlotte's rare approval of her son's taste. Bianca's son is closely guarded by a bodyguard, protected so well that it's not easy to approach him. Chloe has a cunning plan to make the young man slip up, and with a knowing nod, she discreetly informs Bianca that the police suspect her son of murder. Bianca immediately confronts her son, who confesses all too quickly. He thought Chet was smuggling behind Bianca's back, so he killed Chet to prove to his mother that he could be part of the business. Bianca is speechless, revealing to him that Chet's operation was under her approval. After all, she profited 30% from it. Bianca finds her son is clearly unreliable, especially after hearing he left his phone at the crime scene, likely to be found by the police. Within the son's phone lies the secrets of Bianca's operations. Chloe, overhearing the mother-son conversation, is caught but claims to be a fan of the son's music, narrowly escaping trouble. The police cyber unit can't unlock the phone, so Ella has to try every four-digit combination. Bianca, now aware of the entire murder committed by her son and the deal with Charlotte, knows the traded item must be important. She demands that Charlotte steal the phone from the police station in exchange for the item. Charlotte is caught by Chloe while preparing to steal the phone and is forced to reveal that she's Lucifer's father's ex-wife and Bianca is threatening Lucifer's life to get the phone. Chloe is shocked. It's a toss-up what's more explosive, the phone theft or the fact that Charlotte is Lucifer's stepmother. Dr. Linda is facing a medical license review and is on the verge of losing her license for helping Lucifer steal God from the psychiatric ward. 
Maze is furious and demands Lucifer first secure Dr. Linda's job. But as the audience knows, Lucifer's help often backfires. He not only fails to change the medical board chair's opinion of Dr. Linda, but accidentally reveals that he used to pay for his therapy with sexual favors. Mays is enraged and confronts Lucifer in the street, accusing him of treating everyone like pawns, just like he hates his father god and mother. This provokes a fight between Mays and Lucifer, who brawls until they're both spent. Only then does Lucifer realize Maze's anger and assure her that he would never abandon her. He was only keeping her in the dark to convince Amina Deal and his mom of Maze's rage, making them believe Lucifer truly wants to return to heaven. Learning she was used rather than abandoned, Maze feels heartbroken, and Lucifer still doesn't understand why. Dr. Linda has been suspended from her duties, and it seems she's no longer bound to the ethical guidelines. She pointed out that Lucifer hadn't considered Maze's feelings at all, which led to her getting hurt. This was the moment when Lucifer realized just how selfish he had been. He immediately apologized. When Chloe came to find Lucifer, the bruises on his face had mostly healed. Back to the case at hand. Since Bianca made the first move, Chloe teamed up with Lucifer's mother for a counter-strategy. Charlotte delivered the phone to Bianca, but not without pinning a wiretap to her chest, allowing the police to eavesdrop and catch them in the act. Bianca's men confirmed that the phone hadn't been tampered with by the police. Satisfied, Bianca handed Charlotte a key to unlock whatever Chet had smuggled in. But before taking the key, Charlotte intentionally damaged the wiretap with water. Chloe immediately ordered the attack, and the police subdued Bianca and her gang, except for her son. Lucifer checked if his mom was unharmed, but really, he slyly took the key from her. Chloe felt something was off about Charlotte, but even after searching her, she found nothing. Indeed, intuition can't always beat a trickster. When they used the key to open the safe, all they found was a book written in ancient language. Only Amena Deal could be relied upon. Amena Deal would need a few days to translate the content, leaving his mom in a fit of anger. Her body can't wait that long. She secretly contacts Bianca's runaway son, thinking he must have a way. However, upon meeting, the man stabs Charlotte, which would be fatal for a human, but for Lucifer's mother, it's a major blunder. The energy shooting out of the wound incinerates the man to ashes. Charlotte bravely uses a stapler to close the wound, calling the cleaners to handle the scene. On the other side, Amenadiel discovers that God split the flaming sword into three parts, Azrael's blade, the belt buckle, and the key that binds them. Amenadiel also learns that the key had been entrusted to God's favorite son. He thinks the favorite son of God is the rebellious Lucifer, so Amenadiel asks him to hand over the key right away. But Lucifer is clueless and points out the key around Amenadiel's neck. Amenadiel is shocked to learn that he is God's favorite son. Thanks to Maze's investigation on the chairman of the review committee, whether by persuasion or coercion, Dr. Linda managed to sort things out. As a result, she was able to resume her counseling practice. On her first day back, her patient was none other than Lucifer's mother, who, injured and unable to go to a hospital, had no choice but to seek help from Dr. Linda. Although Linda is a doctor, she doesn't usually tend to wounds. Yet under Lucifer's mother's intimidating presence, she reluctantly agreed to help. The injury, brimming with energy, shocked Dr. Linda a lot. However, she managed to bandage Lucifer's mother's wound with some cheap tape and no major surgery is needed. Lucifer and Chloe arrived at the crime scene. They found a body with a charred head but otherwise clean and it was clear it was Bianca's son. Lucifer was clueless and troubled. Ever since Amina Deal found out he was God's favorite son and disappeared with the flaming sword, Lucifer had been seeking Dr. Linda's help. He stumbled upon the news of his mother's energy overflow and Bianca's son's death. Now all Lucifer wants is to find Amina Deal quickly and use the flaming sword to return to heaven before either his mother explodes on Earth or Chloe discovers his mother as the murderer. Both scenarios are unbearable for him. Maze is the best bounty hunter, and when Lucifer sought her out, she was playing doctor-patient games with Trixie. To protect the humans she cares about, like Dr. Linda and Trixie, Maze agrees to find Amina Deal as soon as possible. The police identified the victim as Bianca's son. Chloe notified Bianca's eldest son, but he had no clue about the murder of his brother. Lucifer's current task is to seriously hinder the police investigation to prevent any suspicion from falling on his mother. 
Ella has already found the cleaner sisters who professionally handle the aftermath of a body, but they haven't revealed any useful information. With no other options, Chloe had to return to the station to continue her research. Mays quickly located Emina Deal, and with a stun baton at her disposal, dragged him back to the Lux bar. Ever since discovering he was God's favorite son, Amina Deal distanced himself from his mother's camp. He couldn't let his mother harm his father and refused to surrender the flaming sword. But now his mother is about to explode. Whether he likes it or not, they must send her away, or humanity will suffer greatly. Just as Lucifer convinced Amina Diel, his mother caused more trouble. Before leaving Lux, Dr. Linda inadvertently mentioned Lucifer's actions, making his mother suspect a conspiracy. As a result, she decided to forcefully extract the truth from the vulnerable Dr. Linda and got the answers she wanted. Pretending nothing was amiss, she returned to Lux. Lucifer and Amina Diel were trying to convince their mother to return to hell and reign supreme to minimize the damage to humanity. Already furious upon seeing her son scheming against her, she angrily left, vowing revenge on society. Lucifer prepared to follow her as Amina Diel went to check on the poor Dr. Linda. The case had a new victim. One of the cleaner sister's heads had been burned. The remaining sister refused to reveal the truth. However, Chloe, using minor clues, managed to trace it back to Lucifer's mother. Meanwhile, Charlotte was leisurely strolling through the seaside amusement park, waiting for Chloe and Dan to come and arrest her. She threatened Lucifer with Chloe's life to hand over the flaming sword. Lucifer could only plead with Amina Diel, who then revealed the location of the key. Mays and Amina Diel later found Dr. Linda, who had sustained severe injuries. Only at her breaking point did she reveal Lucifer's plan. With Dr. Linda's life hanging by a thread, the demon Mays pleaded with Amina Diel to find a solution. At the amusement park, Lucifer managed to retrieve the key from Dan's pocket, a safekeeping spot decided by Amina Diel. After all, their mother wouldn't expect the key to be with her paramour, and even Dan himself was unaware of it. Chloe questioned Charlotte alone, mentioning the death of one of the cleaner sisters. Charlotte was taken aback, denying any involvement in the deed. Before Chloe could extract further information, Lucifer arrived, brandishing the flaming sword. Suddenly, Bianca's eldest son burst onto the scene, intent on killing Charlotte to avenge Bianca and his younger brother. The standoff was tense until the man fired his gun. At the crucial moment, time came to a standstill. Amina Deal, in an effort to save Dr. Linda, discovered he could use his powers again. Seizing the opportunity, Mays rushed Dr. Linda to the hospital. Lucifer then used the flaming sword to slice through the fabric of space and time, sending their mother to a new world, a realm of chaos where she could create an entirely new world of her own, free from the painful past with God, her husband. Initially reluctant to leave, Lucifer's words moved her. She hated her husband, but an angelic war would mean the death of angels, all of whom were her children. Preferring to hurt herself rather than her children, she decided to leave out of love for them, and her maternal image remained intact. As time resumed its flow, their mother left Charlotte's fleshly form, allowing Charlotte to survive. But she was no longer the woman that Dan had once adored. Chloe discovered that Bianca's eldest son was responsible for the cleaner sister's death, all to draw out Lucifer's mother. Now that Lucifer's mother was gone, the death of Bianca's youngest son was pinned on the eldest. Dr. Linda's life was saved thanks to timely medical attention. Lucifer sincerely apologized to Linda, who responded with calm acceptance. She knew she was dealing with the most powerful and dysfunctional family in the universe. Choosing to be Lucifer's friend meant accepting all consequences, good or bad. Lucifer was touched by this friendship and felt he should be honest with Chloe. However, just as he was about to come clean, he was knocked unconscious. Without Chloe by his side, he should have been invincible, yet he was easily overpowered, indicating that the assailant might be someone special. When he awoke, he found himself in the desert with his large chicken wings restored. This is Daniel CC Movie Channel. Stay safe and enjoy your day.